If we can get everyone to take their seats. I'd like to remind everyone to turn off any pagers and cell phones that you have on you. Okay, we're going to reconvene this meeting from a meeting that we had early this, mor this evening in the closed session. I'd like to report that there were no actions taken in closed session. Let's see. Um, Invocation, uh, Chaplain Tony Durham. Please stand, please. And take off any of your hats if you have any heads, head covers. <laughs> Father, we want to thank you for all the blessings that you have given to us, like being able to pray and honor our flag as we honor the men and women who have fought every day to protect it and us. Father, we pray that you would stand alongside our military, especially their families, because both have sacrificed so much. Father, we, we are blessed to have the city council and the staff that truly care about our community that we live in and our way of life. We appreciate the council's work. It's endless and they, in their attempt to find ways to improve our city. Lord, we ask that you watch over the first responders, give them peace as they respond to calls that truly would traumatize most of us. Our police and fire have endured so much, and yet when you talk with them, there's always a positive heart and a smile. Yes, Father, we are truly blessed. Thank you for all your love. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, um, city manager's report. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, before <coughs> Chaplain Tony Durham gets out of the room, I'd, I'd want to make a quick message and a thank you, sir, for uh, my understanding is for the uh, every 15 minutes program that's been brought to our high schools. Uh, for the last 18, 19 years, you've been heading that up, and uh, this last year was your, your sign-off year as I understand, is that correct? If there's a God. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. My, my, my granddaughter goes to Cabrillo, and she'll be a senior, and will probably be in the program. And if that's the case, then my wife and I can't do the program. Very well, I understand. I wanted to thank you very much for the program that you brought to Cabrillo and to uh, Lompoc High Schools. and. Uh, I was able to attend the event this year at Lompoc. It had uh, a very gripping impact on me being involved for the first time and I'm sure on the kids and just seeing the silence among the students in the stands as that comes across. So I thought it was um, appropriate, not only to thank you very much for your leadership in this, but I wanted to take a, a quick few minutes if we could and just show some highlights from the event. So if you all don't mind joining with me, thank you, Chris. As we're waiting on that, there's seats available up front. There's about a dozen seats up here if anyone wants to take a seat. Thank you, Chris.
Why don't here. you come on up? Even though we can hear you from back there. I figured my voice would carry. <laughs> this, is, this was our 16th year doing the program between Lombok and Cabrillo. And since we started this program, prior to the program, we were losing one to two students a year, every year. 2001 was the last student that we lost between prom and graduation, and that's the target window of this program. So, well, we thank you. couldn't do it without the city. Uh, everybody you saw in that video volunteered their time. Law enforcement, paramedics, EMT, sheriffs, our fire department, our local police department, um, the city itself, uh, all, all the businesses, uh, tow companies to the mortuary to the hospital was phenomenal. So it's not a, a one-man job. It takes multiple entities to, to do the program. Um, and I just want to say God bless Lompoc. Thank you very much for your leadership <coughs> in that and for the lives saved. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Um, Mayor, also, if I might, as part of my report, Obviously, um, the council chamber is fairly full with people that peers might be interested in the Motorsports Park um, project. And uh, after uh, Thursday night's action by council, I know there's been a lot of, of dialogue, discussion, and information flying around. Some of it as uh, misinformation or disinformation. So I wanted to take just a of minutes if I could to uh, make sure uh, some facts out there that are indeed facts that uh, uh, to, to clarify the issue. First of all, the action that council took was to deny a request to change the memorandum of understanding between the city and the foundation and by doing that 
to avoid uh, creating an additional $140,000 of city funds at risk for the project, over and above the $123,000 that the city already has at risk. It instructed staff to discontinue its work on the project. What council did not do was kill the project. I've seen things in print that called it the kill vote or things like that. Didn't kill the project. Um, nor has it presented or instructed me to present to the foundation any demand for the $123,000 that's already owed to the city. Did want to point out that the staff report, as it was written for Thursday night's Motorsports Park item, was accurate at the time that it was published. And indeed, there was additional information and changing information that happened from the time the report was published, and we have to publish in advance by law. There was, there were, there was new information that was developed and uh, came into being from the time of the publishing till the time that staff presented its report on Thursday night. And staff presented an update of all relevant information at that meeting. So I cover this because uh, there's been an allegation that council did not uh, have before it to consider all the updated information. Quite the opposite. Staff presented, council had available, and carefully considered all the relevant facts. Actions, uh, some of the actions that have occurred by the foundation since Thursday night appear to have validated some of council's act action to some extent. I'm, I'm really concerned over reports I've been having from multiple um, participants within the foundation, project participants, about an impending insolvency of the foundation being named by the leadership and what its impact might be on other parties and other projects within the community. Obviously, the foundation is a separate entity from the city. We don't have oversight. We, the city, don't have oversight of the foundation or its internal accountings or, or operations. So it, it's hard for me to speak with certainty what those impacts would be, but certainly from, from my observation standpoint, I can't see why council's actions, limited and described as they are here, how that would have any possible impact let's say, for instance, on a Fallen Warriors project or on a bike skills project or anything else, unless there's been some commingling of funds or something within the foundation, I don't believe there has been, um, but I, I don't have a way of knowing. I just certainly hope there hasn't been. Um, that pretty much wraps up there. I could probably go into hundreds of issues that I've heard, but I just wanted to hit those few highlight points um, so that we don't take too much of your time that's not scheduled. I, I, I know you've got a lot of other things scheduled tonight, but I just sort of wanted to correct the record on, on some of those most basic and significant issues. And if we need to, we can you know, ultimately uh, respond or react to other disinformation, misinformation that's out there, just trying to keep the record straight. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions for the city manager? Okay, we're gonna to go to public comment on the consent calendar. This is your opportunity to speak to us for up to three minutes on anything on the consent calendar. Okay, seeing no one rise, we're gonna close public comment. Bring it back to the council. Um, consent calendar is cons consists of issues that are normally considered routine and will be approved by one motion and a second by a council member, unless a council member chooses to pull an item. Does any member choose to pull an item? No. Council member Starbuck. No, I was gonna make the move we accept the consent calendar. Okay, um, if we can have a second. I'll second it next. Okay, and you, any discussion? No, I won't worry about it. Okay, I just have one discussion. Um, on item number four, it's, it's concerning the um, we debate and nuisances if staff could also possibly, in conjunction with this, contact Caltrans with the weeds that are growing to the entrance of our city, both on 246 and 1, if, that was, if these were properties inside the city limits, we'd, they'd be on our list as well. So possibly contact Caltrans. Any other comments? So, um, 
Dina, yes. We can make that contact for you, no problem. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, anything else? Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Can we vote? Okay, and that passes 5-0, thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on to staff presentations. Uh, we're gonna have uh, staff introduce several new city employees, uh, starting with uh, C Assistant City Manager Teresa Calavan. Thank you, Mayor, members of council, and the community. It is a great pleasure uh, for me to introduce our new Community Relations Manager, Public Information Officer, Samantha Scroggin. Samantha has been a marketing and communications specialist with Dignity Health for the last several years, and prior to that, she was a staff writer for the Santa Maria Times. She has her bachelor's in journalism from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and we're very pleased to have her join us at the city. So please welcome Samantha. I'd just like to thank everyone for the warm welcome. The city's been so great to me, and I'm just really privileged to be here and serve the city. So thank you so much. Okay. Teresa, anyone else? Utilities Director Larry Bean would make the next uh, welcomes. Good evening. I would like to welcome uh, two new employees who will be running our electrical division for many years to come, I hope. I'll start with our new electrical utility uh, manager, Tikan Singh. Come on up. Tikan uh, graduated from the University of Sacramento Sacramento State in electrical engineering. He has been working the last few years in uh, water resources up in Roseville, and he's come down to join us and run our electrical division. He is a registered electrical engineer in the state of California, and he shortly will be receiving his master's degree in electrical engineering from Sac State. We are really happy to, and honored and lucky to have him come visit us. I'm very glad to be here, and thank you for a wall, uh, warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce Manny Mora. Come on, Matt. He is our electric utility engineer. He's from Santa Maria, California. He just graduated in January, or end of December, from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo in electrical engineering. He was an intern with us for uh, several months before we hired him full time. Again, we're very lucky and happy to have Manny with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. I've, I've had the pleasure uh, to help some of you in the counter and I hope to keep doing that in the future. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, that's it. Okay, now we're gonna move on to oral communications. If you, oh, one more. One more? Ah, yes, okay, thank you. Yes. We have uh, Lombok City Safety Committee. Okay, the Lombok City uh, Safety Committee was developed, has developed the Above and Beyond Award program where employees were nominated by their peers for actions above and beyond their work tasks on a quarterly basis. The nominees and individuals that made the nomination will be recognized tonight for the second and third quarters of 2014 and 15. Bob Wetzel. Maintenance Supervisor for the Water Utility uh, serves as a 2015-16 Central Committee Chair. He'll announce the 2015-16 Above and Beyond Awards. When you, the awardees hear their name, if they want to come forward to be recognized. Mr. Wetzel. Thank you, Mayor, Council, staff, and citizens of Lompoc. Good evening. My name is Bob Wetzel. I'm the uh, fiscal year 15-16 Chair for the Central Safety Committee and I get to announce every quarter, this is the second and uh, third quarter, the uh, awardees for Above and Beyond. What's, what's neat about this award is this is uh, nominated from the, the peers, people that work with these individuals and they feel that they've done something 
that's a little bit uh, above and beyond their normal jobs. So the first uh, nominator was Mike Gonzalez and Keith Quinlan, and the awardees are Peter Almada and Jack Doty, Solid Waste Collections. I don't know if they're here. Peter Amata and Jack Doty are recognized for their above and beyond action when they assisted a city of Lompoc resident who fell from her bicycle at the intersection of North V and Central. Their actions reduced possible injury, averting a possible automobile accident, and provided aid to a citizen in need. The second award was nominated by Lorenzo Gonzalez, and the awardees are Gustavo Lopez and Ernesto Lemus Jr. Streets. Gustavo Lopez and Ernesto Lemus Lemus Jr. are recognized for their above and beyond action when they assisted in traffic control and the movement of a stalled vehicle out of traffic on East Pine and H Street. Their actions provided aid to a citizen in need and reduced traffic congestion and hazards. Third nom uh, awardee is nominated by Lee Eddy and the, the awardee is Michelle Davenport at the library. Michelle Davenport is recognized for above and beyond action when she recommended a modification to computer wiring at the library to reduce hazards for the city of Lompoc computer users, library computer users. The next awardee is nominated by Gail Greer, and the awardee is David Pateri in the landfill. David is recognized for his above and beyond action when he recommended the placement of keep out signs on the fence at the water basin at Avalon and Olive Street. His actions provided notice to protect citizens from hazards due to rain accumulation at the basin. The next nominator was anonymous, but it was awarded to Armando Zapeta and Bobby Garcia in the water division. Armando and Bobby witnessed an automobile accident at La Parisma Road. Armando called 911 for emergency response while Bobby checked on the accident victims to see if they required medical attention. Hey, there's Bobby now. Armando and Bobby then moved the vehicles out of the roadway to reduce any further hazards. They were not on site until fire and ambulance response arrived. The next awardee and nominator was Dirk Ishiwata, and the awardee is Daryl Thomas Facilities. Daryl Thomas is, award, is recognized for his above and beyond action when he realized that the stair covers at the police station were cracked and created as a, a trip hazard. He hung signs and initiated an emergency work order to have facilities maintenance repair and remove the hazards. Joe Cavanaugh nominated Dory Sykes and Human Resources. Dory reviewed and requested parking lot curb painting to reduce the congested parking and hazards when cars are parked in the access lanes. Streets maintenance and facilities did a review and repainted the parking areas to reduce congestion and possible injuries to pedestrians in the parking lot outside of City Hall. Joe Cavanaugh also nominated Cesar Badaro and David Patera in the landfill. Cesar and David are recognized for their above and beyond action when they provided traffic control and emergency response to a traffic accident at Olive and V Street near Miguelito Elementary School until police and fire first responders arrived. And the last, the Central Safety Committee has nominated and awarded facilities. Facilities maintenance is recognized for their teamwork and efforts to maintain a safe workplace, respond to repairs, work requests, and safety issues. So those are the second and quarter okay. nominees. Thank you very much. Okay, now oral communications. Uh, this is your opportunity to speak to us for up to three minutes. If you wish to speak on an item that is on the agenda, you may want to wait till the um, agenda is called, that agenda item is called. I'm assuming there's quite a few people that wish to speak on the motorsports park. Could I see a raise of hands, people that want to speak on the road, Motorsports Park? Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to give you two minutes tonight instead of three minutes. So, go ahead. Mayor, um, most of those people have less than 30 seconds to say, so I appreciate if you'd give me the three minutes because I'm covering the, the ground on this. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, first, with regard to the city administrator's comments at the prior council meeting when the, this project was discussed, there was numerous discussion about the fact that the foundation would have to repay the whole amount. The foundation is a single corporation and although we have various committees within the corporation, each of which has its own checking account and manages its own funds, we are a single corporation. So if there were demands made by the city against the corporation, it could be against all of us, therefore the concern. 
Secondly, I think another major concern is that the Council's action last week unfortunately caused the EIR work to cease with about three days left. And those of us who have spent five years working on it would surely like to know what that document says. So a few more things have changed since the last time we talked, and I want to share them with you this evening. As most of you know, we received an email today from Sixto Fernandez of State Parks, and it had the amount that we would actually owe in a grant match, which was $101,504 for CEQA and NEPA, plus $7,690 that would be for the drag strip. Additionally, if the foundation had to carry the entire burden of the airport master plan, that is currently estimated at $73,000. That would be $182,000 and substantially less than the $270,000 that was discussed at the workshop. To the city administrator's point, there are a lot of changing things in this. There were probably more things we didn't know than we did know. So as of today, we have raised all of the funds to cover the $109,000 between the CEQA and NEPA and the uh, drag strip share of the NEPA. And at the bottom of the stack, you'll see a $20,000 cashier's check, which was tendered to us with the understanding that if the council canceled the program, we would not deposit the check and we would return it. So going forward, the only thing that we have to raise money for would be the $73,000 for the airport layout plan. And you'll recall from the memorandum of understanding that <clears throat> the city council or the city staff is to work with the foundation to find funds if possible. Also with regard to city liability, because we now have all of the funds for the NEPA and the CEQA, as opposed to the $120,000 liability that was discussed in the past, the only liability would be the $73,000 if we defaulted on that. And as you can see, we're pretty good at raising money. So by moving forward, you would reduce the risk to the city by $47,000 and you would also have the opportunity to draw $43,000 in non-specific non funds, the indirect cost funds. Okay, well, I'm gonna wrap it up. That happens to be my okay. end. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so the rest of you, if you wanna line up, who that has to speak, and we can give them each two minutes. Uh, my name's Carl Creel. I'm resident of Lompoc, chairman of the Motorsports Committee. Um, in light of the new information, uh, in light of the fact that uh, even, even the nice presentation that Tony Durham did, it shows the need for this project. You can see the desire of the community. Um, when I spoke last Thursday, I mentioned that the council needs to address the desires of the whole community, not just the vocal uh, select few. So uh, it didn't appear that happened. In fact, in the court of public opinion, it appeared your minds were made up before you ever walked in the uh, chambers. That sends a bad signal to the community. If you're against this project, maybe you shouldn't be voting on it. But uh, nonetheless, things have changed. And due to those changes and the fact that this is wanted by the community, I ask the council to reconsider your vote from last Thursday so we can move forward. The people of the community want to see this EIR. I mean, all the concerns that they've raised, all the fear mongering, I think would be alleviated if they see the details. Because that's been the fact that they've, they've been complaining because there's either no information or misinformation. So the community deserves the right to see this EIR. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. My name is Quinn Leister. I live in the city of Lompoc, and I'm here to support the Motorsports Park and ask the council to reconsider their decisions last week. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Good evening, Mayor, City Council members. My name is Ruth, ne Ruth McKenna. I live in the city of Lompoc, and I support the Motorsports Park. I'm asking for some of the City Council members to reconsider your last week's vote. It seems no matter what any given person or organization is trying to accomplish, there is always a mountain to climb. Well, I feel that we are at the top of our mountain and it's time to start listening to the majority of people who want the motorsports park to happen. 
I understand that all voices have to be heard, so please keep in mind that there are more motorhead people that would love to see this motorsports park happen than people that don't want the project to go through. Some of us were in Santa Barbara this past Sunday and sold 42 tickets, yay, and at $50 a ticket, so I thought that was like pretty awesome. Um, I was amazed how many people still believe in us and was very happy to hear that we are still pressing forward. Um, now I would like to ask um, to see how many of the city council people up here um, have read and understand our MOU. Can I see a show of hands, please? Actually, actually we're not going to do that right now, so just go ahead and finish your discussion. Why not? Because we've all read it. Okay. Have all of you? Has everybody read it? Yeah. The MOU? Okay, um, we're not going to accept any heckling in the crowd. If you heckle, we're going to ask you to be escorted out. Has, any, has, every, has each and every one of you read uh, our agreement between you and us? Okay, you, you're six years, okay. you've got 15 what? seconds left. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mayor, just for the um, public to know, the public comment period is an opportunity for the public to give comment. It's not to create a situation of dialogue between the council and the public. The purpose is for the public to give comment. Thank you for that clarification. Okay. Well, Schuyler, Vice Chair of the Committee, I live in Long Pope, fourth generation. Uh, racing has been a part of my family, been a part of our tradition for many years. The farmers work very hard, then there are slack times, and that's when they'd work on their cars and stuff. It's our history, it's our legacy. I feel that uh, the last meeting was uh, not, not, not the meeting that we all wanted, and I strongly urge that you reconsider this matter and get us to the environmental impact. A lot of uh, people have made statements that may or may not be true once that document's released. So. Please reconsider and keep the project on hand. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, please. Hello, my name is Joshua Meadows, and I came here today to ask the council to reconsider their decision. Um, I've been here for about two years so far, and this is the biggest group of friends and family I've ever made, is around the motorsports community. And I would really love to see that bring some growth, and some, both social and economic, to our city and I think it'd be a great thing. And I'm, I'm proud to see all these guys here, whether it's my friends, my family, or fellow townspeople. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next, please. Um, my name is Bill Robertson. I'm a, I live in the Lompoc Valley and uh, I'll just say right now that I asked the council to reconsider their uh, vote last week. And then uh, after these other people speak, I have a few words I'd like to say, okay? Thank you. Next, please. Hey, good evening. My name is Nolan Parsons. Uh, I support the, support the initiative for the uh, Motorsports Park here in Lompoc, and I am local to the Lompoc Valley. Uh, I will say I'm also in support of any initiative by the city that uh, seeks to have an immediate, positive, tangible impact on public safety. safety. Um, it's ingrained in American culture and here in Lompoc uh, to be involved in motorsport, to race, to watch, to participate, to be a supporter. And that said, um, while well, conjecture, the odds are that uh, there's going to be young and old folk alike that occasionally make a, a, a decision that could negatively impact their safety and that of those around them out on the streets here. Uh, the ability to save maybe one life by uh, offering an outlet for people to go ahead and pursue this passion um, is worth more consideration and the funds that it would require, in my opinion. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Next, please. My name is Terry White. I've lived in the Lompoc area for 55 years. I grew up at the base and moved to Lompoc and lived in Lompoc <clears throat> most of my life. <clears throat> most of the council members have seen me at the Flower Festival. I volunteer there. I also help at the Christmas Parade every year. Um, I've done day of caring, many other uh, activities in Lompoc. And I feel that this is a necessary a project to keep the kids off the streets, illegal racing. Also, uh, to keep the uh, airmen on the base. Uh, they get muscle cars and they, they tend to go a little fast also. Uh, but I think this is a good thing for Lompoc and I'd like to see it reconsidered. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, please. 
Hello, uh, my name is Mike Rhodes. Um, I live in the city of Lompoc. Uh, I own a home in the city of Lompoc and I live in Lompoc Valley. Um, I'd like you to reconsider your vote um, from last week and press forward with this uh, motorsports park. I grew up in, this, in Salt Lake City. At the beginning of every school year and at the end of the school year, we had high school drags. Um, you didn't have to be a great athlete to be, to be part of the team of your school. Heck, I drove a dirt, a dirt bike motorcycle and my car down the drag strip to score points for my school. It was a matter of pride that our schools would have You'd carry the trophy from the beginning of the school year and you'd try to keep it at the end of the school year and have it through the, uh, through the summer and then go back in the next year. Um, and so it, it adds to the school projects um, and something for the high school kids to do, keep them safe and sane place to, uh, to race their vehicles where they're inspected for safety and they're wearing helmets and just we're doing all the right things. Um, didn't do the drag racing on the streets because I had my time slip. I knew how fast my car was. It's digitally proven, so there's no guy waving his arm or uh, doing anything like that. Is no discussion. My car was faster than yours. I didn't have to drag race you. We just showed it on a little piece of paper. Kept me from drag racing on the streets. Kept me safe. I'm here today. I'm a paramedic supervisor with American Medical Response. I've been with them for 22 years. I see the accidents that happen from vehicles, from kids doing silly things in cars. This project will give them a safe place to do that, give them that out, along with lots of revenue into the, into the community. We have a multitude of businesses that are local businesses that are already involved and have their money down on this and looking to go more. They are here because of you guys. This is what you support them, they support you. We need this, long, we need this motorsports park. It'd be good for the whole community. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Next, please. Hey, my name is Taylor Harrison, Lompoc resident, been here for a few years. Um, I just want to say I think you guys should reconsider your vote about the motorsports park. I think it'd be a great project and helpful for a lot of kids. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, please. Hi, my name is Susan Ellickson. Um, I live in the city of Lompoc. I support the Motorsports Park Project, and I would ask that the council would reconsider their decision for last week. Um, I got up last week and spoke after all was said and done. I wish I would have spoke sooner. Again, people don't know the facts of what's been planned for this Motorsports Park. It's been amazing to see the people that are now asking questions via social media. People that weeks ago, I saw them spouting off at what a bad thing this was, and now they're going, all we knew was it was a drag strip. We didn't know you were gonna have a mountain biking path. We didn't know that you were gonna have a kid's section to keep them safe, where they can ride away from the big kids and the adults. We didn't realize how much you guys had to offer the community. It's not just about drag strip racing. Yes, that's part of the project. And yes, I'm hoping and praying it will get the kids off the street and do it in a safe location. But so many people's eyes have been open to what this can possibly offer our community. And I really hope you reconsider your vote from last week. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next, please. Michelle Tonyazzini, resident of Lompoc, councilman, mayor. Uh, we all have something to contribute. I'm a proud member of the project. I do believe this project is an answer of common problems in the community, a safe, designated place to ride and drive. The project represents building communities through parks, recreation, and philanthropy. The definition of philanthropy is goodwill to fellow members of the human race, especially, an active effort to promote human welfare, the dictionary definition, the good fortune, health, happiness, prosperity of a person, group, or organization, well-being, the physical or moral welfare of society. This project is not a drag strip. It's not a bar scene, and it is not immoral. This project is an active effort to promote, to promote human welfare. A man watches his grandson run around the, ride around the track for the first time without laying his motorcycle down. So excited. Grandfather says, practice makes perfect as he rides around again. We cannot deny the fact that the pollution folks are worried about currently exists in our community on our street. These racing cars drive the streets of Lompoc every day. The dust folks are worried about only cover the eyes of those who can't see the good this project is providing in an active effort to promote human welfare 
philanthropy. Folks, if we don't come together, Lompoc is nothing but a ghost town awaiting our moment of six feet under. I ask that you reconsider your vote. Thank you. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Next, please. Hello. My name is uh, Gil Murrow, and my brothers and I own a hot rod shop and automotive rest restoration shop here in town. Um, we've been in business now for over 10 years. Um, if it wasn't for motorsports, uh, I'm not sure what we'd be doing at this point, but the motorsports has been able to uh, give us a pathway to do several things that I didn't think we'd ever be able to do in life. We've traveled and done lots of things and met some really unique people, and, and uh, it's been really good to us. Um, and I think it's been a long time if, I mean, we've, I've been here for, since I was 10 years old, and Lompoc has never had anything for the youth to be excited about. I think this is the biggest thing in probably a long, long time for the youth to be excited about. I, I think I speak for most of the people here. It's just, uh, I mean, like you can tell, I mean, look at everybody here. It's, it's a very exciting thing for, for the community, for the youth of the community, as well as everyone else. But I, uh, I feel that uh, I hope you guys can really strongly reconsider your vote from last week. And I uh, hope, uh, hope this really goes through. I appreciate your guys' time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, please. Hi, uh, my name is Randy Murrow, and I uh, live here in Lompoc. Been waiting for something like this to happen our whole lives. And uh, all these gearheads here, good-hearted people, down-to-earth people, and we all, uh, we all enjoy the same thing. We'd uh, deeply appreciate it if you guys can reconsider the vote from last week. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, please. Hi, my name is Luis Espinosa. I, uh, I live here in the city of Lompoc, and I'm with, I support the Lompoc Motorsports Park, and I'm asking the, you guys to reconsider your last week's vote. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, please. Council, Mayor, I'm uh, here to ask you to reconsider your vote. I've been uh, born and raised here all my life, and uh, families have plenty of business here, and I, I really support your guys' decision to reconsider. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, please. Hi, Bob Manfrina. Uh, I was born here, raised here, went to school here, made a living here, retired here. I also raced on the streets of Lompoc when I was a kid. I think I was lucky I wasn't one, you know, like one of those kids on, that, on our pre thing there. Anyway, I urge you to reconsider your vote. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next. Hi, my name is Travis Bryson. I'm here to support the Motorsport Park. Uh, piggybacking on what my friend Nolan said, if we can save a life by taking kids off the street by racing, I think we should really reconsider this. It's very important. I mean, as a gearhead, we have a big family, and as we can see here, we have more people that are supporting it than anybody that's denied it so far. So if you could strongly reconsider this, everybody here would greatly appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, sir. Next. Hello. I'm Tyler Burnett. Um, I live in the city of Lompoc. Um, I support the Motorsports motor Park and ask the council to reconsider last week's vote. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next. Hi, my name is Ramiro Lara. I live in the city of Lompoc. I support the motorsports, and uh, I hope you guys can reconsider your vote from last week. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next. Hi, I'm Joey Chaboya. Uh, I ask you to reconsider because if you actually go to a factory car lot, cars are going much faster off the shoreline floor. This would actually help the kids at high school if you go to the parking lot and look at them and see how many fast cars there are, they're not getting slower. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next. Hello, my name is Marcus Wilson. I uh, moved to Lompoc in 1978. Um, I thought it was interesting that we started the meeting with a video that shows what can happen with street racing. Uh, I know that that was meant to show drunk driving, but the same thing happened with street racing. You guys have all seen that. You've seen people die in the streets. Um, people are going to race. There's no way around that. What I would be asking you to do is reconsider the vote and give people an opportunity to race in a safe environment where they have an opportunity to learn how their cars handle, what's going to happen if they do get loose and out of control. It's going to make people safer. Um, I've been involved in different motorsports um, on track, uh, autocrossing in different areas, and I know that all these organizations are very professional. They do a good job at safety. They give everybody an opportunity to uh, learn how their cars perform. And I do ask you to reconsider your vote and give this an opportunity to survive. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next. My name's Tristan and I support the Motorsports Park and I ask you guys to reconsider last week's vote. Thank you, sir. Next. 
My name is Airman Gennetti with the United States Air Force. I strongly wish you guys to reconsider your vote. Uh, when I think of Lompoc, all I really think of is your guys' penitentiary. And I think this could really change people's idea of Lompoc in a more positive way. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your service. Next, please. Hello, my name is Thomas Taylor. I lived in Lompoc for 22 years, and I've worked on my own cars and bikes for the last 10. Uh, the motorsports community is such a wonderful group of people. You can see they're very enthusiastic. They're willing to take time out of their evenings, their weekends, their nights to help each other out to come to city council meetings. And uh, I think this would be a huge opportunity for Lompoc to really put it on the map for young people. Growing up through middle school, high school, um, anytime you're looking for something to do on the weekend with your group of friends, the answer would be, well, the first thing I'm going to do is get a car and leave Lompoc. Uh, you know, what are we going to do in town? Um, so you can see so many people would be so happy for this to happen. Uh, the community reaching down from Los Angeles, Ventura, Lompoc, five cities, all the way to uh, San Luis. We all communicate together, and we all are a very tight-knit community, and this would really make uh, Lompoc a hub of activity. It would be a great ch uh, chance for us to really be something more than just, you know, art and flowers, which is great, but there's so many enthusiastic young people that like to have something else to do here. Thank you, sir. Next. Hello, my name is Julian Van Remio. I've lived here practically all my life. Um, I grew up here, went to school here, and just like uh, Tom said back there, gr growing up in high school, you know, on the weekends, you just, one of the first things that happens in high school is, you, you know, you get a license, you learn how to drive, and that's pretty much your outlet. Um, your outlet is just driving around aimlessly around town. Some, some people get a little more into cars, and of course, you know, things like street racing happen. I feel like that's kind of ingrained in, you know, America's culture. Hot, hot rodding was a big thing back when cars first started coming out, and people modded, modified them. That was just a kind of a thing that just, happened and it evolved into something a little more and you know it's done all over the country and a lot of people from around this area they they have to travel pretty great distances if they want to do it legally um, and some many people do they, they drive very far to Bakersfield for example and I just think it'd be a really great thing to pursue this project and also aside from keeping people safe on the streets it keeps people from doing other things I mean there's a lot of people a lot of people know, a lot of the car guys know, I mean, it's kind of hard to do anything bad if you're working on cars. You just spend, it's a lot of money spent. Um, you're, you're either working or you're working on your car. There's no time for any, like, bad activities on the side, that's for sure. So, strongly wish you guys would reconsider. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next. Hi, my name is Antonio Carreno. I live in Lompoc Valley. Been here for 10 years. I support the motorsports pro uh, project. And I really urge you guys to reconsider your guys' vote and help this community grow. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next. Hi, my name is Rachel Woya. I live in the city of Lompoc, born and raised. Um, I support the Motorsports Park 100% and would love to see this thing further on. And hope you guys will reconsider your vote. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next. Hi, my name is Manuel Velasquez. I've lived here all my life and born here. And I would ask that the council reconsider their vote on the motorsport parks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next. Hi, my name is Junior Cortez, and I will want to participate in this motorsports project and agree with it because I think it's fun and a good idea to vote. And I would guys reconsider your vote. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next. Howdy, my name is uh, Alberto Cazares, and uh, I've lived uh, in Lompoc my whole life, born and raised, and I uh, really hope you guys would reconsider opening up the Motorsports Project, because, uh, I don't know, cars has been pretty much my whole life. You know, they interest me, They're, I've known people from cars, pretty much most of my close friends have been all car friends, you know. It's something to do on the weekends, what, what are we going to do, work on a car or something, you know. And then uh, it'd be a lot safer uh, for the community of Lompoc, well, not just Lompoc, but everywhere in the area really since uh, people people don't have an outlet to go you know people just take it to the street where else would they take it there's no track around here the closest one I could think of would be either in LA or Bakersfield so I'd imagine having this motorsports park here would be a great idea not just not just safety wise but also uh, revenue there'd be a lot of revenue coming in from everywhere in the area pretty much but thank you thank you sir next My name is Jacob Gustafson. I'm a Lompoc resident, and I'm not involved in motorsports in any way, shape, or form. Um, I'm not involved with the project, but I sure do like taking my kids to events like this. And I would love to be able to take them somewhere local to enjoy 
races. I think it's a lot of fun, and I think it's a great thing for families to enjoy together. Um, and I hope you reconsider. Thank you, sir. Next. Hi, my name is Jesse Shepard. I live in Lompoc, and I support the Motorsports Park 100%, and I ask the council to reconsider their last week's vote. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next. Hi, my name's Kelly Kennedy. I've lived here 28 years. Um, I've been involved with Santa Maria Racetrack for 16 years. We race vehicles there. I've seen the amount of income that they bring in. Um, I've seen amount of people, families. It's not just a bunch of guys with dirty hands. It's families. They bring their whole entire families. They come. They stay in hotels. They eat. They, you know, they socialize. Um, I'm totally for the motorsports park. Um, I'm asking you to reconsider. Take a look at the amount of money that's coming into the dunes just down the way. The, you know, the amount of people, they come from Bakersfield, they come from LA, they're from San Diego, uh, um, even as far as Arizona. I don't see what the deal is with, you know, the, the income alone. You guys are talking about the kids, it's all about the kids. Well, it's not really about the kids. It's yes, the kids need something to do, but it's the income. There's no reason why we can't have wine and wheels in the same town. Um, it's just, it, something needs to be for the families in the area and something needs to be done to brought a, bring a lot of money into Lompoc Valley and to, to support our hotels and our wineries and our eating establishments. And I'm asking you to reconsider. And like I said, it's not just about the kids to give them a safe place to come. It's about bringing families from other areas all over to enjoy Lompoc and what we have to offer. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Good evening. My name is Brian Blakeborough, and I'm here tonight to ask you guys to reconsider the Motorsports Project. I know you guys are killing it. it. It doesn't just affect that project. It affects many more throughout the community, and I think that you guys should revisit it and take a look at it and uh, make a judgment from there. Thank you, sir. Next. City Council, uh, thank you for being here. John Johnson, uh, I was up here last week. Uh, I just want to say uh, we had a race in Idaho last weekend, and there were probably 350 people at $50 a piece and 48 people at $100 a piece. And these people spend anywhere from $500 to $1,000 just in fuel, let alone two or three days on their, their driving back and forth. Uh, Santa Maria Speedway just started up, uh, or Santa Maria track just started up Speedway uh, three weeks ago. They had 250 people and each person paid up to $60. I just happened to race four races at $60 a piece. And I would do the same thing here. Uh, right now I have four people, if this passes, that's willing to de donate $10,000 each as soon as they know this is going to work out. But the money, it, it's just going to floor in. And thank you for being here and have a great night. Thank you, sir. Next. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I just want to say thank you for uh, allowing me and others to speak tonight. Uh, my name is Rutson Ross. I'm currently a high schooler at, at Cabrillo High School. I'm a senior. Um, I can definitely say I'm the youngest one uh, speaking tonight. Um, let me ask you one question. When you think of the future, what do you see? You see, when I think of the future, I see my generation. And the reason this is kind of at my concern is because I've lost countless friends due to illegal street racing um, out of California, but that's not the point. The point is I've lost countless friends, like I've said, due to street racing. It's, it's stupid. That's what it is. What I'm asking you to do is to save my generation and generations to come by rethinking your consideration on the or reconsidering your vote. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next. Now, sir, you've been up here once before, and I know you made a comment about keeping it short, so tell me what you had said when you left. You've already spoke once, is that correct? I just said I just, the, I just waited until the end of the line, and I was going to take my two minutes if I could, so. Go ahead. Okay. But um, my, one, one bite of the apple for everyone, okay? Go ahead. Okay, man, my name is Bill Robertson, and uh, I support the Motorsport Park. Um, I'd like to address a few of the comments from last meeting. The people, uh, the people this will attract was number one, okay? My father retired from the Air Force and um, moved here when I was young. I graduated Lompoc High School in 1977, got married and raised my children here. I've owned a business here for many years. I employ local people. I support local programs. Um, 
I'm a staff sergeant in the National Guard. Um, I'm a member of the State Honor Guard, the Elks, the American Legion, the VFW, the Church of the Nazarene. I sponsor baseball, soccer teams, um, school programs, and just about any other organization that asks me. I spent a year overseas in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom, uh, a year in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. Um, so, the, you know, that's the kind of people that you don't want to attract. I don't know. Um, the second one is property value. I own property in Lompoc. I own property in the village, and I live in Providence Landing. And uh, I think this would be a plus for people wanting to move here, okay? Uh, the third thing was the noise. I own many cars, four of them over 300 horsepower, uh, one over 400 horsepower, one over 500 horsepower. They all have stock exhaust. I don't like a lot of obnoxious cars, and anything that runs at the park would have to be tested for decibels. Okay, the fourth thing was the dust. Um, we live in an agriculture valley, and nothing could come close to the amount of dust picked up by a 20 foot disc behind a tractor. Okay, I also have motorcycles. I can't ride because the nearest off road area is two and a half hours away, um, unless you want sand and salt through your, uh, through your machine. I don't race anymore, but I would if I, I wouldn't mind having a place to uh, open up my vehicle without worrying about getting You need to wrap it up, ticket. sir. Okay? Okay. okay? Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your service. Next, please. Hello, my name is Brandon Bridge. I'm a local business owner and business developer. I am a local resident and homeowner. I have volunteered for numerous of the projects that uh, John Lynn has supported with his foundation. I would like to comment here of numerous things I have seen leave this town. The shuttle, three theaters, a pool, which all of your backs are turned to, the skating rink, a mini golf, batting cages, mud bogs, and flowers are on the way out. You have helped bring wine. The tourism, it is very common to see a developed or undeveloped area take on a racetrack. We can look at Santa Maria and Denver, large and small. They developed a track outside of the community and such that that point in time, the residents and businesses have moved in. We also look at our own airport. It was moved originally from where it was to where it is now, to a non-developed area, to allow it to be away from residents. Residents have moved into the area. I would like to talk about the track record that the foundation has. They have brought numerous parks with little to no help from the city council as an organization. We brought you members in to support the change. You continually block it. They have parks in their mindset. That is what the community wants, whether it be golf, a motor park, or a bike course. At this point in time, I would like you to reconsider your vote, specifically you three members. Thank you, sir. Next. Good evening, I'm Grace Handlin. I'm a resident of Lompoc for 30 years. I raised both of my girls here. And um, my youngest came home one day what was, with what was called a little red rice rocket. It was a little Honda hatch. And it screamed, and it was scary, but she got it on her own. Um, you know, you're busy, your kids are working, you're working, life goes on. I hope I'm not boring you. This is important. She, thankfully, she survived the car. She got to be on a first name basis with most of the police and sheriff's department. Um, just a few years ago, we were talking about how lucky she was that she made it, you know, to be an adult and she has a family now of her own. And we were talking about the car and she said, you know, she said, there was the night I should have died. She narrowly missed a concrete pylon traveling over speeds of 80 miles an hour. My daughter also participated in the Every 15 Minutes program. And in that program, I had to write a letter to her as if she had died. So when you do that, I don't know if any of you have had a child who have done that, you have to put that yourself in that space to be able to write that letter to your child who has died. My daughter could have died that night. I used to cruise State Street. It was OK. Here, it's not OK for kids to cruise. They need somewhere to go. They need a safe place. And this would be a safe place to go. One of the alternatives when she was in high school was the kids would all gather on a ranch outside town. They'd drink, they'd party, they'd have a great time, they'd get in their cars and their trucks, and they'd hit the road. 
I think we need to show our kids they don't have to involve alcohol and illegal activities to have a good time, and I think this is the place to start it. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Next, please. How do you do? My name is Steve Bridge. I've lived here for 40 years. I'm a property owner and a business owner in the community. I'm going to come at this from a different direction because I believe in procedures and processes. And you guys have worked for two and a half, three years with a group in partnership to get to the EA. And a week before the EA comes out, you make the decision you made last week. How can of us in an informed manner decide if we're for or against the motorsports if we don't have the facts in front of us. So that's one place. I think you should follow the procedures, your partners. The other place I'm coming from is you should be fair. None of you guys were surprised. This foundation has worked on this for years. You guys had a memorandum of understanding to get to a place where you can make a decision. To cut it off because the NEPA came out as a new requirement is giving up because times are tough. We don't give up for, in Lompoc for times tough. You guys should buckle down, find a solution, get to the EA, and then let us make an informed decision. Let's not just make it because there's a bunch of guys on the hill who can yell, or there's people that are confused on what the facts are. I don't know what the facts are, I haven't seen them. Give me the materials so we can all make an informed decision. So I'm requesting you reconsider your, uh, your decision. Thank you, sir. Next, please. Hello, my name is Brandon Matsey, and these are my daughters. Um, uh, we are residents of Lompoc, and uh, we support the Lompoc Valley Motorsports Park project. We beg you to reconsider uh, your decision from last week. It's going to help everybody, including these two little ones over here that are too shy to stand up and look at you. But with good decisions, they'll probably look at you really nice. <laughs> please reconsider. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, please. My name is Tyane Campfield, and I'm a Lompoc resident, and I would like for you to reconsider your decision last week that you made. I am not a gearhead. Um, I don't even change my own oil. So this isn't exactly something that I would probably participate. I'd probably be a spectator, but I came to support it because I've heard a lot of people say that the support is only coming from people who are going to use it. I have 13 nieces and nephews that live in Lompoc, and it seems like it's a daily struggle for them to stay on the right path. They're doing a pretty good job, but some of them, it's scary times right now. And I'd like to see for some of my nephews to you know, be taking an interest in cars instead of what Lompoc has to offer right now, which seems to be drugs, gangs, and a penitentiary. And then when you become 21, you can go to the wine ghetto. So again, I'd like for you to reconsider your decision and support the Motorsports Park. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Good evening. My name is Brenda Thea. I'm a Lompoc resident. I had moved from Lompoc when I was 10 years old, came back recently three years ago. Um, I am a racing mom, I've been a racing girlfriend, I've been a racing wife. And I think it's perfect because my kids growing up, going to school in Tucson, Arizona, they had a drag strip, they had a dirt track, and they also had an asphalt track that they could use and go and race legally. And I think my biggest problem with my kids growing up wasn't the drugs, it wasn't the gangs, it was, they, I was getting calls saying that they were spending too much time in auto class. So I would really like the council to reconsider their decision. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next, please. Donald Edward, uh, I'd like to congratulate the three members that made the adult decision. Uh, if you read anywhere on the internet, you find out that no one wants a drag strip within five miles of any residential areas. Uh, Lincoln, Nebraska set up criteria Everybody should read it because it makes sense. Uh, one of the key statements that I saw in the Lompo paper was, no one's property value ever went up next to a drag strip or in a drag strip area. One of the things that I got corrected, the traffic problem is going to move on to North Avenue and V Street and O Street, and all the noise 
from that area is going to be in Walmart, in all those subdivisions that are out there. And you can bet that the city lawyer is going to be hearing from a lot of these people that are going to be disenchanted. Luckily enough, I turned on the city council ch chamber tonight and realized that you're playing to a stacked deck here. And uh, the adults sometimes make the right decision, and I'd like to congratulate the three people that did. And I'd like to pass this on. I wasn't able to be here for that last meeting, which is a shame because I've got some pertinent information that I think every council member should read that's an adult. One of the things that you're being played with the idea that kids are going to benefit from this drag strip, you can bet the adults that are pushing this are the people that want it. So that's my two cents. Thank you, sir. Next, please. My name is Oscar Escobar, and uh, I live in the city of Lompoc. I am originally from Houston, Texas. Um, back home, there is a motorsports park eight miles away from my house. And um, that being said, there is no illegal street racing problem back home. Um, you know, we showed a little video before this meeting, and it was teaching people how to drink responsible. Well, the motorsports park will teach people how to race responsibly. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, please. Mayor and council members, I feel like the lone voice in the woods here. Uh, my name's Ann Rouget. Um, I've been a member of the community for about 23 years, been very active, and as I said the other night, uh, my husband and I have worked very hard to improve the quality of life in this city. I want to commend the three council members who made the right decision the other night. You looked at the problems, you looked at the finances, which is where the crux of the matter is with this. I ask that you not reconsider your vote and stick to your guns. I know it takes a lot of courage and I expect, I would imagine that the last three or four days have been really very busy for you. You've been bombarded probably with a lot of emails and um, phone calls. And I ask you to keep the courage and do what you think is right for the total community. I'm not one of the people that sits on the hill and yells. I live right across the street from where this uh, project is supposed to be. If it was in a different place, I would feel differently. But it is in the wrong place, as several people told you the other night. But stick to your guns and do not change your votes. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next, please. Hi, my name is Zach Wason. Uh, I'm a, uh, I live here in Lompoc. Uh, just about everybody here who's between the ages of 20 to 30, I see on a day-to-day -day basis, every day. We hang out every weekend, and just last December, we all took a trip to Bakersfield, and we all went to the drag strip out there. And after the day went, ended, everybody was like, man, wouldn't it be great if Lompoc had a strip to you know, we could do this every weekend. And there's people from Ventura all the way to past San Luis that I know would come down here every weekend just about and race. And I have a buddy who lives out in Missouri. They do $5 Fridays every Friday night. And he says it does nothing but it gets packed. And so just kind of everybody rethink your vote on it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, please. Good evening, Mayor and Councilman. Uh, I'm Ruth Schuyler, and I'm a member, uh, long time, a long time resident of Lompoc. And I've um, been a member. The Lompoc is a racing community. It's raced for years, raced from the beginning. And I think all the young people, my father included, which and my probably my grandfather raced when he came here. It's been a long time. The community needs racing. A little, you know on a safe area. We need this area. And it doesn't just include motor, you know, the drag strip. It includes uh, motorcycles. It includes the small children. I don't know whether any of you have taken a few minutes to go down to the little race track that we have, the little motor cross track. But there's a lot of little kids going around there learning to do safety and being safe. Uh, there's little girls, three years old, that go around and fall asleep going around because they get tired. But they do enjoy it. And I think it's a place where we can be here in Lompoc and not always travel outside the Lompoc. 
Mayor and City Council, I wish you to cons reconsider your decision. Thank you, ma'am. Next, please. Hello, I'm Paul Hornberger. I was born and raised in Lompoc. When I was in high school, we used to be able to ride motorcycles in the riverbed, and there was a lot of people there. You can ride from one bridge to the other bridge, and it was great fun. When my kids were young and growing up, I used to travel two to three hours on the weekends to take them to go enjoy motorcycles. This is more than a drag strip. It's for families, and when we take off for the weekend, we'd go for a day. We'd leave Saturday, Sunday morning. We'd come back in the afternoon, and we'd spend our money in other communities. We'd go out for breakfast. We'd go out for lunch. We'd go out for dinner. It's more than just a drag strip. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Okay, come forward. Okay, anyone else that wants to speak, move, move forward to the podium up here. Good evening, uh, City Council. I'm Gilbert Navarro. I've been with the uh, Lompoc Park Rex and Pool Foundation for many years. It isn't something I do on a regular basis. I don't really hang with a lot of people, but I hung with this because it was about the people. It was the reasoning behind building the motorsports park was about the people. It wasn't really for the people that are in the foundation. It was for the people outside, amongst us. That was the reason I stuck with them. It wasn't like myself. I, I wanted to bring a bike park to this city. I don't even ride a bike. I did it for everyone else who's been coming. I've met so many people, New York, San Diego, Florida, Spain, Colombia, California, all parts of California, people that have been coming. And they've been talking about the motorsports park, which was kind of interesting. I've had more people that wanted to ride motorcycles in the bike park. And I said, well, you know, we're hopefully we're going to be building this entity with the motorsports. Anyway, it's about the people. Please reconsider. Um, like I said, I don't ride a bike, but it was for the people. And that's really what this is about. And I'm sure we can figure something out. Like I said before, I don't live on the hill, that hill, this hill, or that hill, but I do live over here. And I do have that speed trap next to me. And since last week, it's been really great until today, which all of a sudden, all today, a bunch of people were speeding, but it is what it is. I love Lompoc. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, please. <clears throat> Good evening, gentlemen. As you know, I'm the process gal. So I just want to make sure you're you know what's in the city council handbook because the city attorney just told you that public comment was only for comment. And so I'm going to read out of the city council handbook where it says all remarks and questions should be addressed to the council as a whole and not to any specific council member, staff, the audience, or the media. No question should be asked a council member or staff member without first obtaining permission from the presiding officer. Mayor Lingle, you are the presiding officer. So if you choose not to answer any questions, then that is your choice. It's not because that's not what this is for. Thank you. Hey, hey, hey. Oh, oh I'm not done, sorry. Um, I'd also like to, um, I'd also like to add one more thing. Oh, I, I will only take a little more time. Uh, I would also like to um, read to you B23, placing business on the agenda, also from the City Council Handbook, 
where it says, during public comment periods or by correspondence with council members, a member of the public may ask council consider an item and upon consent of a majority of council members present, a staff report will be prepared and processed for a future agenda. So now you have had over 40 people come up here and ask you to reconsider the vote. And there's nothing to prevent you right now from turning to all these other council members that you have and saying, do we have three votes? You got all these people in the gallery waiting. Are you going to make them wait until the very end of the meeting? Or are you going to see right now if you have three votes? And that's a question. That's a question. If a council member chooses to recommend uh, reconsideration, we will discuss it now. OK. So do any of you? We want to, we're going to finish public comment, though. Oh. I think everyone has a chance to speak, not just 98% oh. uh, of people. OK. Well, I mean, you, you can answer. I mean, maybe it would shorten the meeting. I'm not sure. Yeah. Thank you. Jane. Jane Bear. Hello. My name is Joel Montes. I'm a recent graduate from Azusa Pacific with a bachelor's degree in exercise science. I'm currently pursuing a degree in physical therapy, doctorate. I see great potential for this project. It could present uh, benefits rising revenue for uh, illnesses such as muscular dystrophy, cancer, and other illnesses. Um, I fully support this motorsports project, and I ask that you please reconsider. Thank you for your time. God bless. Thank you, sir. Council members, uh, I'm Ian Baer, and I'm a Lompoc resident and business owner, and I fully support the motorsports park, though I am not a racer, and I urge you to reconsider it, and given that we've heard from the handbook, I urge you to reconsider it now, because as Jane Bear said, these folks would like to know what's about to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, seeing no one rise, we're going to close oral communications. Councilmember Starbuck. Well, I guess rather than waste everybody's time, is anybody willing to reconsider? Is that a motion? It's a question to just ask for second and third. Now I need a motion, then a, a second, and um... I'll second it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Let's vote. Okay, clear the clear the. Clear the. Okay, the motion is for reconsideration of last Thursday's vote. That means that if we vote to reconsider it, staff will prepare a staff report, bring it back to the council for reconsideration of last Thursday's vote. If we vote no, last, last Thursday's vote stands. Is that clear to everyone? Councilman Starbuck, is that your motion? Yes. Okay. Vote in stands. Let's vote. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, I guess we're not going to hear any noise if this thing passes, right? Okay. Um, any other city council requests at this point? Comes well, I'm not going to do anything more tonight, but I do want to have another discussion on this project, maybe down the road, because there's some questions that have not been answered. I don't think anybody's against the, what the facility is, but it's really where it's at. I didn't hear anyone in any of their comments that we should put it in the river bottom, and that's what the big kicker is on this. Now, the, nobody I didn't hear any against the facility and what was going on down there, but I think, and there's also a couple other things on the foundation that needs to be cleared up. Uh, and I might as well bring it up. There's all this discussion of the 66,000 or 67,000 of fallen warriors was going to have to go under the foundation. And that's not right. This council did not set that up. 
So there's some things that were brought in. And like I say, yeah, everybody says you've been here. I've been here since 1950. I've seen a lot of things happen in this town too. But a racetrack in the river bottom is not gonna work. Hey, comments from there, we'll ask the police chief to escort you out. Okay, um, let's take a 10 minute break. Okay, if everyone can take their seats. Okay, we're gonna move on to public hearing. This is, um, oops, okay. We're gonna move on to public hearing. This is item number five. Approval of fare adjustments for Dial-A-Ride and Santa Barbara shuttle services for the city of Lompoc. This is Mr. Fernbaugh. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, you have a recommendation before you tonight to hold a public hearing and approve amendment number five, which is a joint powers agreement with the county for fair adjustments in the county. Adopt resolution 604116, establishing new dial a ride fares for both city and county service and the Santa Barbara shuttle, or provide alternate direction. At the council's meeting of January 5th, Council reviewed and approved the chief master fee schedule, the, which recommended dial ride service costs within the city go from a dollar to two dollars, and that service in the county go from a dollar and a half to four dollars. Um, the master fee schedule also included a, an adjustment from six dollars to seven dollars per trip for the Santa Barbara shuttle. Uh, current fares for County ADA services are before you this evening. Uh, you can see that we're fairly low in the city and our new adjustments will move us uh, up quite a bit. Um, but one of the things to consider also is that uh, our ADA service currently uh, recoups about 3.3% of its cost and state mandate is 20%. So we're looking at uh, hopefully increasing our fare box and meeting the state standard. Um, in conclusion, the proposed fare adjustments keep coal in, in conformance with the current FTA requirements. Staff concurs, concurs with the city council approval of the master fee schedule um, that includes adjustments for city and county ADA services and Santa Barbara shuttle. Available for your questions. Okay, any questions for Mr. Fernbaugh from the council? Okay, um, we will move to public comment. Any public comment on item number five? Oops. This is item number five? Yeah, it is item number five. Okay, okay we're going to close public comment, bring it back to the council. What's your desire? Mr. Homdahl. I read through it, and I, I'd support it, so I'd move to uh, support staff's recommendation. Okay, that's motion to support. I'll second it. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Let's vote. Oh, no, take, take my, my screen. <laughs> there we go. There we go. That was all right. <laughs> I pressed the wrong button. And that's 5-0. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to council request item number six. Affirmation of approved utility service charges for fiscal year 2016-17. And this is Ms. Wall. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Lingle, members of council. Um, this has become an annual event for the uh, four years out of the last, uh, and it should go for five for the water and wastewater. And this will be the third year out of five for the solid waste review. You know, what we're asking tonight is for, um, 
Let me back up for a minute, I'm sorry. The enterprise funds are self-sufficient. They should be able to support themselves. Um, ad additionally, and I know you guys have seen this several times before, but thank you for, your, for anyone that hasn't seen this. We need to also make sure that they're in compliance with any bond covenants and loans. We need to make sure it has an operating reserve of 90 days, um, and it's the principle that we should be striving for the enterprise funds. And additionally, we should have money set aside to reinvest in the city's capital infrastructure for pipes, for wells, for anything that re redefines that uh, particular enterprise fund. Um, so where have we, where have we been? Um, this is just on water and wastewater, and we're looking at what was recommended through the Wilden study, um, what was approved through the city council, and what we're affirming. And originally for water, they had recommended a 19%, 18%, 17%, 15%, and then 0% at the 2017 year. What council would desire to do is to make it a level playing field over the five years for water. And the 15% for the first year allowed the city to meet the first goal, which is to make sure our bond covenant met uh, the ratio approved. What we've affirmed through uh, the last three years is a 15%, 15%, and 7.5%. And the wastewater rates, what was recommended overall was a 21%, 17%, and then 11% for three years. And what was approved was a 21% and 10.5 for four years, trying to give a balance to the rates. Um, and the council has affirmed those for the first three years. So what, is, what has that gotten us? We, um, the goals we're trying to meet, again, the bond covenants is a ratio. And we accomplished that and for both water and wastewater in year two. Um, positive net income we've done for water in, in year three. Uh, we plan to have the operating reserves, um, which is a 90 day or three months so for water for five years in wastewater plan to get there in over, um, excuse me, that should be 10 years. And to establish a reserve fund uh, we plan to start being able to have money set aside for infrastructure over the five-year period, but in the, our study in 2013, council decided to put that over a 10-year period plan. And again, this just kind of reaffirms our goals that we've met the bond covenants for the bonds in water and wastewater. Um, for the SRF, which is the State Revolving Fund, that's just wastewater. Um, we haven't met those yet. We've met the one-to-one -one money needed to pay the, the SRF, but we're also put, supposed to put aside about $4.5 billion, which we haven't started yet. Um, the 90-day operating reserve. Um, in water, we're pretty close. We've got 81 days if we do it with what we're projecting, but for wastewater, it's about 141 days to the negative. Um, and repair and replacement, we really haven't set aside the money that we need to set aside for those items. Um, in solid waste, we're recommending a 3.6 over the period of 2014 to 2018. Um, and council did a, approve those over that period of time. And we've affirmed it for the first two years of the rate. The rate increases budget for solid waste um, it requires a 90-day reserve. That is currently met, and the reason why it's met is that we haven't gone into building the landfill gas collection and control system. And we're starting to go into the bid process, so that should be coming along shortly. And the additional rates are also needed for operational and capital needs. Now, this information was brought forward to the um, utility commissioners on May 9th, they decided to table this um, until the enterprise reimbursement study had been completed by city council. Tonight we're asking you to approve the rates that were uh, approved in 2013, 
So with water, that would be the 7.5% that we we did not do last year, and then the 15%, so that's a cumulative total of 23.6%. We're asking for the 10.5% for wastewater and 36 for the solid waste. And be happy to answer any questions or take comments. Okay. Councilmember Mosby. On the water rate of last year, we put forward a seven and a half percent. How did that, uh, what, how did it result in revenues? But currently right now we've collected about 3% of that 7.5%, so it's less than half that so, we were anticipating. Okay, less than half of that. Did you, is there a reason why we didn't get what we were hoping to get? Well, there, there are two reasons. One is the drought that people are complaining to use less water. The another, the another reason is that people being aware that they can save money by not using as many units, they've been very good at, at conserving their water. So they were able to conserve their way out of that a little bit, of the rate okay. increase? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Wall? Oh, I'm sorry. Councilman Starbuck. Well, in regards to that, so what we're actually looking at on that slide, we projected a firm 7.5%, but the actual revenue that... Today. Yeah, to because of the conservation February. activities. Yes. What did that do in effect with the wastewater at that time then? Uh, you have to remember that there are the a long couple billing. components. Yeah. So people, usually in winter, it doesn't, that's the lowest, lowest time that you're going to use water. So it hasn't in, impacted it as greatly as half. But people have been conserving even in wintertime. And... Um, so the effect on this basically, Melinda, would be down the, a few years when the average comes out again where we would yes, notice so that you, in the wastewater. Of course, it's a six-year average. You're dropping the lowest, you're dropping the highest. And, right. Yeah. So probably this will be one of the lowest, and we'll see this in three, five years from now then, the reflection of what actually will happen with wastewater. Yeah. It's, it, additionally, you have to remember, though, that we do have the water plant, wastewater plant as a whole, and we've got our partners, which um, include uh, the Fanberg Village Community Service District and the Air Force Base. And over a period of time, we've seen less use from the Air Force Base, and the CSD has been very good about conserving their water, too, so we're not getting as much um, revenues from their, that source. And the last question I want to ask right now is the state revolving fund covenants wastewater has not met those. What do we need to do in wastewater to meet that? Well, we've met the one-to-one -one payment. We've made the payments. The problem is that we haven't put that one-year amount, the $4.5 million, aside. And what we need to do is take that much money and put it in a reserve account. And we haven't... Basically proof we have the money in, in advance form. It's, it's a, a future uh, investment. They expect you to ha be able to have money to make improvements after the 20-year loan is done. So it's not really a, it's nice and they'd like it, but it's not really a mandatory have to have it? Or is I, it lower our credit, so to speak, later? The bond covenants, they check on us every year. They make sure that we are, we're doing what we need to do. I haven't had any inquiry from the state revolving fund about what we have in reserve yet, but we realize that we need to have that money set aside. We know someday they'll ask, huh? Yes. <laughs> Ms. Wall, if we can go back a slide real quick. Um, um, yeah, right there. So does this say that it, Currently, we are meeting our, our bond covenants. I think that's what I just heard you say. We're meeting the covenants for the bonds, which is our um, 2000, the 1998, the 2002, and the 2005 bonds. Okay. Yes. Okay, and that was one of our goals. Yes. We, okay. The other goal was to have a positive net income, and it looks like we have it on water, not yet on wastewater. How far are we? Was that the negative 147 or something like that? The, um, I mean, 
Is that, yeah, that's that the negative 147 days? 100, yeah, that's 147 days to get, um, that's what we're projecting in um, 2017 to meet, to even to do that without any kind of rate increase, it's 187 days. So, and that's on table eight. Okay. So we're not there yet. We're not in, in any. So with no rate increase, it would be 187. No, yeah, no rate increase would be 187 days as shown on table eight. Okay. Any other questions for Ms. Wall? Okay, we're gonna to go to public comment. Anyone wishing to speak on this item? Oh, actually, uh, yeah, go, public comment. That's all right. I won't read your notes. Okay. <clears throat> Council, Mayor, John Lynn, um, with regard to our, the decision made by the Utility Commission, we discussed this and we felt that Putting, moving forward with rate increases when we did not know what portion of the, um, the next item down, the transfers, were, was going to go through, wasn't appropriate. And if it takes one more month to do a rate, the rate increase the right way, that's better than rushing in and doing it the wrong way now. Um, people are struggling in this town, as you've all heard from many, many people. Um, I think we all understand that there's going to be a wastewater rate increase but I think we need to have better information on both solid waste and on water to determine if that's going to be needed. And we're not going to know that until this council decides this evening or at some future meeting on the other issue, because that is really the, the 25,000 pound gorilla in the room. That's, the, that's where all the money is. So um, I would encourage you to put this aside until that decision is made, and maybe you make that decision and, and then discuss this at this end, the end of this meeting, alter the order of the agenda. And if the other issue is resolved, then you can address this, and if it isn't, I would urge you to continue this after having the appropriate discussion this evening. Thank you very much. Mayor, City Council, Brian Cole, Lompoc resident. Thank you for listening tonight. I'm in accord with both Bob Holloway, Utility Commissioner, and John Lynn, Vice Chair, that the methodologies of the so-called Enterprise Reimbursement Plan are flawed and do not reflect the actual cost of services that the utility departments will be required to pay. This is the fourth year now of increases so far. As a county example, Mission Hills, as of March 2016, reduced water usage by 38%, but this was perceived as a problem apparently to the general manager of the district because of lost revenue, and blames Governor Brown's 25% reduction mandate, and will be increasing water charges from $9 to $57 per meter. And I'm just thinking that that should get an attaboy and lowered rates for stellar conversation, conservation. I now pay an average of $250 a month minus gas for a three bed, four occupant residence and we're being conservative. Another personal example, per day my household has used 748 gallons of water per day less than last year. I have been surprisingly cited by Glen Ellen's HOA as have many others for the browning of their lawns. Shouldn't those that conserve and use less be recognized and rewarded with lower rates I believe they call that positive reinforcement. The purpose of the enterprise reimbursement plan is raise revenue, meet debit, debit obligations, rebuild fund reserves, replace aging water and sewer pipes, and so on. How it is doing that is now held to question. August 2014, council members were asked to approve $63,712 from the general fund reserves including $40,424 from utility reserves. Oh, that's where some of it went, to pay for consultants. I definitely need to come out of retirement. But you get my point. I read some of the 195 page and well done 2015-2017 biennial budget, proudly pro proclaiming 
The city continues to protect its utility ratepayers, that's us, by positioning itself to ensure the continued safe, reliable, secure, and available delivery of, and to the last point, I disagree, reasonably priced services. In reading the budget, I lamented that I just wished I had an economic uncertainty fund. I thought that was kind of funny to read that. Anyone here have one of those? I think not. That was ultimately merged within the city's general fund under restrictive reserve. You have to wrap it up. I will wrap. I would just suggest that we take another look at this again and that there are other ways of raise, raising revenue other than as has been suggested uh, prior. And I appreciate all of you guys just kind of putting up with all of that. But we could have ongoing festivals, ongoing public events that would raise revenue Thank involving you, kids and so Thank on. Thank you. Next, please. I'm Bob Holloway. Um, if we uh, approve this before we get the redistribution, uh, you know, then the city hall is going to get all the money. I mean, it's just honest. They're taking all the money now. If, if we got to, we have to go and we have to redesign the redistribution so that uh, we understand what it's all about. And uh, at the last utility commission meeting. We didn't even discuss it because uh, there was no sense in doing anything until we found out what the redistribution uh, project was going to cost us. Uh, I, uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm pretty conservative, and I, I'm 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 appalled at what's going on here. You know, the state says that we can only charge enough money to run the water sewer for what it costs us anything else we we can't raise the rates to do that so what we're doing here is is we're going underneath and around back door and we're we're going past the law and i don't agree with that so um you know i've thought long and hard about this and uh we we just can't do anything until we get this redistribution stuff done and i think that the redistribution thing should just be tabled for a year because we got to figure out what the heck's going on here we can't be taking all the money that we're charging we raised the rate so we could fix the infrastructure and if you noticed on that on that bottom line up there there was no money for infrastructure at all no money at all because after we pay for the redistribution and everything else, there's no money left. Uh, you know, you have to be open-minded about this thing, and you have to let the people know what they're paying for. Uh, you, you know, I've been on the commission for a long time, and I told everybody we had to raise the rates so we could fix the pipes. And now we don't even have, it's three years in, and we don't even have any money to fix the pipes, and we've raised the rates three times. So. You know, it makes me out a liar, and I don't like that. So I just hope you guys reconsider and you don't vote on this and you do the redistribution part of it, and then we'll go back and we'll work on this later. Thank you. Mr. Holloway, I've got a question for you. As you stated, you were, you've been on the commission for a long time, chair for most of that time, and you understand probably better than anyone the need to rebuild our infrastructure, I believe. Um, so I'm just gonna ask you a question. Regardless of the, I mean, take the enterprise study out of the formula right now. Do you agree that we, at this point, need some increase in our water, wastewater? Well, yeah, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna make any, I don't wanna make any decision right now until we get the redistribution. I, I agree with it. you, I agree with you. I mean, but you don't disagree that I'm not disagreeing that we have to raise the rates because what happened is is uh, the uh, Governor Brown said we got to do 25 percent, and everybody else was already going down, so we're about 33 percent, and so we're below the we're below the red line now, in the in the water we're getting less and less. Sorry, where's our public safety officer? <laughs> okay. 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 Thank you, Mr. Holloway.
Try not, I'll try not to trip anybody while I'm up here. <clears throat> My name is Ron Fink. I live in the city of Lompoc. Each of you appointed a commissioner to the Utilities Commission, a, and they've made a recommendation to you. I would suggest that you follow their wise counsel and defer this item until you decided what you're going to do about the reimbursement fee study. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Okay. We'll close public comment, bring it back to the council. What I'd like to do with the consent of the of a supermajority, I'd like to um, take this item, out, rest of this conversation out of order and discuss it again after our discussion, our next discussion on item number seven, which is the enterprise reimbursement analysis. So we'll just continue this until after item, num after we've made a decision on item number seven. Okay. I need, I need the supermajority, so if let's, uh, let's vote on that. Yes. Oh, I pressed the wrong button. <laughs> okay, so we have the supermajority, okay. So we'll continue this discussion after we discuss item number seven. So let's move on to item number seven which is the uh, continuation of enterprise reimbursement analysis. And that is, again, Ms. Wall. This is Brad Wilkie, Finance Director. Um, Melinda has a brief presentation on this item. And as requested at the April 15th meeting, John Farnikoff of HFH Consulting is here to um, address some of the questions that were brought up uh, on April 21st, I believe. Um, I'll just, I'll leave it at that. So here's Melinda. Thank you, Mayor Lingle, members of the council. This item is a continued item from March 15th. Um, this presentation is the same presentation we presented uh, on March 15th. Just basically reviewing the fact that the, that we've had a general fund support methodology um, based on the cost of uh, service study way back in 96, 97 fiscal year. And that enterprise reimbursement study, the general fund support methodology that we used included the same elements that we're um, reviewing for this enterprise reimbursement study. So we, the general fund support covered the items of public safety. It covered the right of way, which had dealt with just the streets, and the return of general fund uh, investments that utilities used. At that time, when they adopted it, they capped it at 5% of the revenue. Prop 218 is a big issue, and it was subject to 218. And limits fees to the cost of services provided. Prop 26 has a new uh, prop has come along and, and it applies to all services, limiting fees to the cost of services provided also. This one's a little, uh, Prop 26 also includes electric. Prop 218 only included water, waste, water, and solid waste. Our current enterprise reimbursement study, again, looks at a reimbursement for public safety, government facilities right away, and it, it ensures that these charges are defendable and supportable. Again, when we're looking at the, these items and compared to our 97 method, which was capped at 5% of our revenues, um, all the amounts combined, you can see that the Costs are, are less in water and, and solid waste. These are actually all combined, and uh, wastewater is greater. So we try to break it down to be a little bit more understandable. The, the first top uh, table is the table that is in the Enterprise Reimbursement Study the Analysis Report. This is the amount that we could charge per year. So that's $5 million for all these items listed above. 
So the enterprise reimbursement study, the second one, it just says, okay, we could, in a two-year period, charge over $10 million for these services. Now, the 97-98 method, um, we're at 3.49, and it shows a difference. Okay, what we tried to do here in the first slide, again, it shows the enterprise analysis saying that we could, if we wanted to, charge $10 million over a two-year period. In our draft budget, we allocated $5 million. So what we're recommending in the, third, the fourth chart, which is the one on the bottom here, it takes what we actually budgeted and what we're recommending. And you can see that um, when we budgeted, we budgeted amounts in transportation, uh, transit, I'm sorry, that uh, was about 500 thousand and we took that totally out because transit basically depends on federal monies and the other items that we're recommending um, so I can go down one we're just staying here on this particular chart I'm sorry we're saying that we're reducing the amount in airport and transit and what we're asking, we're gonna increase amount in the communications internal service fund. And so part of this process is we're asking for a budget adjustment for that $6,000 in the communication funds. And the funds that we're actually asking for less, we actually don't need to make a budget adjustment. And the last one is the uh, historical and projected uh, 97 method. Um, just an overview of each fund and where it is. This last one is the general fund support. And you, as you can see from 1998 to 2005, we've done that based on 5% of the revenue. Now we've had rate increases over the years and we wanted to confirm that the way we're doing it would be via, uh, supportable and defendable. Um, that these are not new fees for water, wastewater, and solid waste. Um, they are new for electric, communications, and the airport. And, excuse me. We did take this to the Utility Commission, and uh, you've heard uh, Bob speak, He's the chairman speak all the way, uh, their, some of their thoughts um, are attached to this document. We do have uh, the response from John Farnkoff uh, concerning the questions that Council had. And at this time, I'd like to introduce John Farnkoff and uh, have you answer any questions that you might have on it. I'm sorry, I did not catch his name. Uh, John Farnkoff. Farnkoff, okay, thank you. Mayor, members of the council, good evening. I'm John Farnkoff. Okay, um, we, ha we had invited him back for questions, specific questions that we had. Councilmember Mosby. Yeah, thanks for coming down. You're uh, welcome. Um, I, I did have a question on, on the answer. I, I appreciate your methodology you put together on, on valuation for the wastewater facility. Um, and I can follow your math and your methodology. And I must say that I, I, I can see, and excuse the way of putting this, I, I find a little degree of creativity with it. And I know in appraising and coming up with appraisals and stuff, you have to have some of that. And I, I understand that there's some of that there. I could come up with a methodology real similar to that. I could come up with a number that would be a little bit lower, a little bit higher. I mean, appraisals are very difficult uh, uh, analysis. It's hard. I understand that. Um, but I guess one of the questions I have is about the electric enterprise that I have there in the, in, in, in this might not be for you, but it might be for Mr. Wilkie. And the, it, it says in here uh, on page six on the response letter that you had back to them. 
And in the middle of the page, it says the electric enterprise covers the cost of street lighting using sources of non-rate revenue. Um, can somebody help me out what the non-rate revenue is? I mean. Thank you, Mr. Mosby. The non-rate revenue is through the ARB. It's a revenue analysis. It's a third party sales that we do through NCPA. And we collect about a million dollars a year from NCPA in credits for that, that uh, selling off to third parties. Does, does that never come up somewhere in the budget book somewhere? Um, it actually does show on our, on our budget. I mean, there is, there is it, a line for it. Is it in there? Okay, and, and it's, it's about a million, you say, or something like that? It's, and, and do we, what else do we spend that non-rate revenue on? It can be applied towards whatever we want it to choose to expend it on. The, um, the electric fund is not a Prop 218, but in case it ever became a question, we did have, oppose it to legal counsel and determine that um, a, non-rate revenue can be applied towards what you wish to apply it towards. Now, I'm not sure when we started paying for street lights, but street lights is a legitimate cost if we wanted to use that third-party revenue to spend it on. Okay, what else do we spend that non-rate revenue on? It just goes into the, uh, to the electric fund. So if there's any money left over, it would just go towards rates. So this is, this is kind of like profit? that comes out of NCPA? Yes. And okay, it's, I wasn't aware of that, that number out there, that money out there. I'll take a better look at it, but maybe we can have a better explanation of it someday. Um, if I may, sorry. Um, Non-rate revenue is also things like um, interest, and um, there are some sales of scrap metal. Anything that's not paid for by a customer would be quantified as non-rate revenue. There are some utilities that have impact fees. That's not. That's a non-rate, non-rate revenue. But so. likewise, in this case here, it would have to be something that's relatively consistent. Uh, some revenue coming in that we, you know, we can account on, uh, for every year. It can't be the sales of scrap metal or something because that's. Uh, yeah, and to some extent, the interest too, because. In 2011, we had virtually no cash whatsoever. So, but now, uh, with our revenue requirement being met for electric, it's generating some st substantial amounts because of the investment process that we've re redid starting in 2014. So, so it's more than just the uh, money that we are getting from the investment in NCPA. Um, facilities, but that was, that's one that has been a fairly s substantial amount. It doesn't always, it, is, it isn't always substantial, so it's, but in the last few years it's been enough to cover that cost. In, which then did, does again come up with a question is if it's, if they have this rate revenue, this rate pool that's coming in, or non-rate revenue, I'm sorry, that comes in and they're paying for street lighting, it seems like there should get some some reimbursement for, for lighting the street. So you're charging them for driving on the street, um, light, like with right-of-way maintenance, but also public safety aspects to make the streets a little safer. They should get some credibility, uh, some, some amount of, of, of credit, I would think, because they're, they're paying for something. I mean, I, I don't know how other communities do. Does anybody know how, who else pays for street lights? How do other communities do this? Well, many other NCPA cities have the same situation. So I believe Hikaya does, for, for one example. I don't know them all, but uh, a m many number of the NCPA cities do it some way, shape, or fashion. So if they're not an NCPA city, how, who pays for the street lighting? Well, an example for, of that is in Santa Maria, I, what my understanding is is they have street light districts that pay for it. So it's a, an, like a property tax assessment of some sort? I, that's what I understand it to be, yes. And I'm, just, I'm just trying to wrap my arms around this because it seems a little, 
you know, if generally if somebody's paying for something, they come bringing some skin into the game, they get some reward for it. And um, I, I'm still not able to, uh, you know, really accept that they're not getting some credit for, for paying out of other revenue that they could be doing something else with. And what, what else do they spend that, that money on, the non-rate revenue? Is there some? Well, like Melinda said, it's, it's part of the, the budget for electric. So we try to get the electric budget balanced every single year. So it's, it's part of the resources available to do that. So then by paying yeah. for lighting the streets, it's part of the resources not available for them to do something else. And that's the same thing with the decision to um, spend money on capital improvements in one type of capital improvement rather than other. It's, that's one of the things that governments have to do all the time is make decisions on what to do with resources. We don't have unlimited funds for doing every single thing that anybody wants to do. It's, it's, it's a balancing act within the utility and across all the entities w within the city. Um, Councilman Mosby, if I can, did you, Mr. City Manager, did you want to comment on Councilman Mosby's question? I, only if he wants the additional information he seemed to be asking for. He want, wanted to know how other cities yeah. did that. Help um, me out. I, and your question is a good one. The bottom line is it's a matter of philosophy, you know, as you said, when you talk about skin in the game. So quick example with the history of Fresno, which I'm familiar with. At one point, the street lights were owned by Pacific Gas and Electric, which is the has the franchise for electric delivery. So in that case, it's not a municipally owned, but rather an investor owned utility. But nonetheless, it, uh, originally, original street lights, street poles were owned by the enterprise. And the thought was the rate payers for the electric uh, utility paid that street light bill because that's the benefit they were getting. They were getting the benefit of the lights within their homes and, and electricity, and they were getting the benefit of the lights out on the street. So again, it's just a matter of philosophy of, well, who, who's, who's benefiting, therefore who, who's paying? At one point along the line, um, decades ago, someone thought it would be a grand thing to have PG&E offered to give those street lights to the city, and the city, for some unknown reason, accepted. And so from that point on, the uh, street maintenance fund, in that case, uh, paid for the has paid for the street lights, which means money that otherwise would have been going to improvement of streets now, go now goes to the electrification of those lights. Um, so is that an improvement or... Is that a harm? It's all a matter of philosophy and how you view it as to who's getting who's getting the benefit and therefore who should be paying. Right, and that kind of helps, I guess, the case that I had about giving them some credit because streets isn't paying for it. Electric is, so maybe some credit should come that way. What percentage, I don't know. Um, but I, I thank you for that. Um, and, and if I can, can somebody else's light on chime in to get in but if i can't follow up on my on my next question on on the cost of street sweeping being included in solid waste um this on the same page next paragraph uh it, it says the cost of street sweeping is included in solid waste solid waste rates because the majority of the material collected by street sweepers originated from solid waste customers as residue that was not collected in their containers so I guess, I guess my question is to that is, is how, did, how did we come to that conclusion? Thank you, Councilmember Mosby. The street sweepers have always come the day after the collection of solid waste. Um, whether or not the, um, the amount of material collected was from people not putting the trash in their cans or what's flowing around in the streets or the leaves. It's all related to the property near it that needs to be cleaned up. And the nexus is that uh, they do it the day after a collection of the solid waste. Right, and, and I understand that and I, I did a little bit 
of analyzing myself on this. I didn't go to one of the street sweepers and dump it all out and, and then calculate how much is sand, gravel, and, and garbage. But I did, uh, what I an decided to analyze is the vehicles. A lot of vehicles are left in the streets when they're street sweep. So when the street sweeper is done and goes by, you, there's, a, there's a certain section you can analyze and see what is there, what is garbage that's left over from, uh, from solid waste, and, and what is either naturally occurring from the biodegradation of the asphalt or dirt accumulation, or a, a large portion of it is organic matter from the, the street trees. Um, and granted, does that really go towards wider ma maintenance? And I guess there's been some discussion on whether it really um, street sweeping helps the asphalt out. But I know if you don't do it, you end up with a lot of gravel on the asphalt, you end up with a lot of dirt, you end up with a lot of sticks and weeds on the asphalt. And those of us had an opportunity to drive um, uh, South H Street after a windy day and those Italian stone pines have, have lost their needles and you've got about four to six inches of needles on there. And I, assuming that's solid waste, maybe Streets is out there cleaning it up, but you could see what kind of accumulation if the street sweeper wasn't perpetually driving around town cleaning that right away. And again, when I, when I see this and if I saw something a little deeper that, that said thoroughly, you know, you analyze by the, you know, the ton and you saw that they, you know, 50% of everything that's cleaned up is garbage and 50 percent is streets falling apart i could i could come to some better conclusion but the statement here it, it doesn't seem that it was fully analyzed that um and, and it seems uh oh i don't want to say disingenuine but i did <clears throat> that the solid waste customers that the street sweepers are picking up significant residue from the containers and i i don't see that i i just I saw in a couple of cases, I saw a few cigarette butts, I saw a couple of water bottles, uh, but majority of everything, I mean a super majority, 95% plus, was other material other than solid waste. So I, I do appreciate the response and trying to get down to the thought process and the methodology here on this, but I, I'm still figuring there, there must be a percentage that could be towards... But it doesn't benefit the streets on the, the right-of-way asphalt. You know, it, the street sweeping would actually degrade it after a while. So the only um, benefit is to, to for the property owner to have their place in front of their home swept. In one aspect, and I've, I've been in a situation where uh, you know, if you, you come in on a, on a on an asphalt that has been taken care of and cleaned, there's a lot of little pebbles and gravels, and if you come up to a stop sign maybe a little bit too fast you have a lot of slip and slide. And in that case, you know, maybe that's something that reduces down in the public safety aspect uh, that they're asking for under the charge because you would see that less accidents if you're, by cleaning the streets. So I, there definitely should be some credit, I think, involved with the street sweeping that you're putting either towards public safety or whether it's the right of way maintenance. Okay. Now, there, there may be some validity to this. This study was based on finding out what the general fund um, needed to do to reimburse itself. It wasn't itemized for those particular items and at some time the council wanted to come back and have us look at street lights or the street sweeping or fire hydrants as a matter of fact. That's something they could do and say, well, we think maybe the general fund should pay for a portion of the fire hydrant or the street lights or whatever. That, that's your prerogative. But this study was basically done to look at the general fund and the costs that they do and how to get reimbursed for those costs. And, and I, I understand that. It, that's, that's kind of one of the difficulties I'm having with this because it's about what the general fund needs and not what is the service being provided. And it's kind of one of the difficulties I'm you know, wrapping my arms around this, but I let you. some other people chew at it. Thank you. City Manager. Yeah, a couple of things. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, one is again we're talking philosophies and maybe practices that are common in, in in the industry some communities for instance it's not uncommon to find that street sweeping is included with a solid waste charge it just is and others they actually set up a separate other communities set up a separate uh, utility if you will a community sanitation um, service that they have that provides street sweeping litter control alleyway cleanups, one-time big item collections and things like that. And so those things are just charged across households 
uh, for that are receiving um, the the services. So it's um, you know it's really a matter of philosophy. As to uh, I appreciate your having difficulty with. It seems like these a number of these things are geared toward um, making the general fund whole as opposed to some other um, focus or, or goal. Um, I, I would just point out, and I, for the benefit particularly for two of you that weren't part of the, my hiring process, and just a reminder for the three that were, um, the, these things were discussed, and, and one of one of the um, goals or expectations placed upon me at my hiring was to enhance uh, the general fund re revenues without going out and doing tax measures, but finding those things that are just and right and legally defensible uh, to, in essence, make make whole rather than having the existing situation that we had where the uh, general fund was underwriting and supporting the, the enterprises to the tune of about $2 million a year. In other words, that was money that otherwise could be available for what we generally want to preserve the general fund for, and that's funding things like police, fire, parks, street maintenance, things like that, rather than, um, rather than undercutting or or um, not undercutting um, supporting and and bringing down utility rates but again that's a it's a difference of philosophy but council's direction at least to me and therefore to staff has been to uh, to find a way to make the general fund whole and when the general fund has been providing services to get reimbursed for that if there's a different route you wish to go, it's certainly your prerogative to, uh, to, to change that focus. If, if, if I can answer some of the, uh, I, I, I appreciate the fact of getting the, needing to get the general fund whole. And I guess that's what I wanna make sure that we're not totally doing here is increasing rates to make the general fund whole if we're increasing rates because of a cost of service being tried to charge to the enterprise, you know, I'm in full support of that. Um, I guess one of the items that really concerns me here is the budget becomes the driver on a lot of these charges, not the cost of the service being provided, not the direct cost of service being provided to the enterprise. It's, um, it, it, it is the budget. If, if items go up, if uh, police and fire protection goes up, and you're not necessarily doing, uh, providing more service, say, to the wastewater facility, um, the, the amount of money that they pay goes up because it's based on the cost in, in the budget of that service. So it's not directly the cost being provided, it's, it's the cost of the budget. And I guess that's one of the, the difficulties I'm having a hard time uh, getting my arms wrapped around. Councilman Starbuck. Well, one of the things that's probably unknown to a lot of people and we're dealing with it currently right now is what we call the full cost plan here or the cost allocation plan. And directly inside the, the cover of it, it says the following information has been developed to illustrate how, you, how to read and use the cost allocation plan. So although this is a sizable volume of data contained in the city's plan, it has been designed so the non-technical user can read and interpret it. I'm far below that then because I've been having a hard time with this. <laughs> One of the things about it, it says essentially the plan provides a cost accounting of who does what, for whom, in what quantity, and for what total price. And it lists a couple of items, but one of them, and number one, is recovery of general fund costs. The administrative departments in the general fund typically provide staff support to enterprise funds and other governmental units which charge user fees for service. So we already have this in place, and now we're, I understand where we're going and what we're trying to do, but I'm wondering if it wouldn't be a more effective way. Cost allocation on a government facility, we list Civic Center, V Street, and Corporate Yard. I don't think we will be saving money up to rebuild City Hall or anything based on the back of the enterprise funds. Right-of-way maintenance. Well, if it's a sewer line that's going to be replaced, then obviously the wastewater utility at that time should pay the fair share of right-of-way maintenance. So 
I mean, remember, we've got two books and millions of dollars in this hand, millions of dollars in this hand, and we have utilities in the middle and everybody that's a rate payer paying left and right. So I think we need to be careful where we tread with this. Can, oh. It's all right if I make a comment. Of yeah, course, Ms. Well. The cost allocation plan that, that you're referring to, um, we did take that to the Utility Commission back in September of 2015 and, and talk to them about what that covers. Um, and one of the things that you should note that most of the cost allocation plan is operational cost. That means any time they use the purchasing yard, any time they get paid, the enterprise funds don't have an individual assigned directly for those costs. So we, what we do on a biannual budget is go through and see how many purchase orders they make, see what kind of stock they supply, see the accounts payable, accounts receivable, and we allocate it towards that. There are a lot of things in the cost allocation plan that doesn't, it doesn't cover um, for the enterprise funds. And one is the building use. And the building use that we have in the enterprise reimbursement study takes that place versus having the building for um, alloc allocation, because we do with the Civic Center, Corp Yard, and other buildings, but no utility funds are charged for that allocation. Um, we do also use any equipment that's used that's through an inter internal service fund that's charged out. The, um, there, but there are several things that are based on you know, the admin service charge, which is the use of the city council, the use of the city clerk, use of resolutions and other items that have to be, that is, that is all charged out. And that's not included in the study from HF and H. Congressman Starbuck. I understand, and I mean, there's millions of dollars in this book. Yes. And it, it's moved from here and it's moved to there. But one of the things, and I'm just gonna throw an example. We'll use the public safety aspect of this. 1.7 million out of these enterprise funds in this enterprise reimbursement study. It's very hard in my mind. I just cannot believe that the, the police and fire respond to wastewater, water, and the landfill to the cost of $1.7 million. I look at the, what we want to do with the, the, the truck. Somebody gave me a whole different pavement index study. It showed trash trucks full, trash trucks empty, what it did on the streets. Um, I'm just having a hard time with this because this seems like it's just going to fund certain little areas and we don't even have infrastructure repairs on tap yet to do right away maintenance to pull the money. So I'm just kind of wondering where we really want to go with this and do the increase every year with something that we don't even have a plan with. So, so this, the enterprise reimbursement study is a five year five-year plan, and it does, they do recommend come back every five years for it. The um, public safety, um, everyone that pays property tax, you know, hopes they never have to use the police or fire, but they pay for it because they want the police and fire to be prepared. You know, um, hope, I hope I never have to use them, but I realize that there is a cost associated with training them and doing the things they need to do and having them ready to respond to us. Yeah, but to the tune of 1.7 million a year off of everything else, you know, like you say, property tax, general fund revenues. I'm, it's a hard justification for me. When we don't have infrastructure projects, why are we charging right away maintenance? We are not going to be doing anything with civic center and all, and we know that we're not going to put this money into a separate account for government facilities. So, it's when we use the term defensible. In my mind, it says questionable, and I've got lots of questions on this right now. Okay, Mr. Farmcroft, if you don't mind sticking around, we're going to go to public comment. We may have more questions for you in a few minutes. But you have a comment? You know, if you, you wouldn't mind, um, I've of been trying to think of what I could tell you that would be helpful in your deliberations. I've, you know, come down here from the Bay Area, and I might be able to provide you just a little more context for these studies. Uh, Back in, uh, well, first of all, I should say I'm a, most of the time I spend my, 
uh, work on uh, water, sewer, stormwater rates. Um, I'm pretty familiar with the law around what's reasonable, what's defensible under Prop 218. Uh, in 2012, we were contacted by Michael Colantuno, who's one of the state's preeminent legal experts on Prop 218. Uh, he wanted us to help a city quantify its reimbursements to the general fund for its uh, enterprises. And this came out of the Roseville decision that said that uh, the court there said there are costs that could be reimbursed, but you can't just pick an arbitrary percentage. That was a problem in Roseville. And the court said, cost it out. So Michael Colantuno said, Let's figure out how to cost these things out. And so since then, uh, we're just starting our 10th reimbursement study. Uh, we've, I would guess, uh, 20, at least 20 attorneys have reviewed our work along the way. Probably uh, easily 50 or 60 staff people have been involved. Uh, the work that you see right now, it, it reflects the refinements we've made along the way based on a lot of input. I'm very confident in the approach as far as its defensibility goes, and I think I'm in a good position just with my experience in setting rates and being an expert witness in knowing what is defensible. Of the, the studies that we've done, none of them have been challenged in court. Uh, four of them, four of these cities, uh, were sued for lack of having a report and our analyses were used in the settlement negotiations. With the other five cities, there has been no litigation once our reports were published. So that's just the, the history to date on how these studies are being done. And it's a, it's a, it's a, a new type of a study. Um, the, I think uh, the word Councilmember most be used was maybe um, inventive or uh, creative, yeah. It is a new type of a study, uh, and I'm very comfortable with it. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go to Mr. Wilkie. Did you have something? Yes, um, just real briefly, going back to Melinda's slides. Um, this slide is looking at the water, wastewater, and solid waste combined which are the three utilities that have rate setting authorities being requested for affirmation tonight. The bar, the bar that's here, as Melinda mentioned, is included in the studies that, we pro that were produced for water, wastewater, and solid waste as part of those studies. And if we were continuing to use the 1997-98 study, these amounts up here would be what would be charged to water, wastewater, and solid waste in total. And that's part of the study. Those amounts are already included as part of the study because that these rates, these charges have been going on all the way back to 1997-98. The bars are what are included in the final draft study of the enterprise cost study of what should be charged within the three utilities. As, as you can see, the amounts that are proposed for the current fiscal cycle is less than what, we, what would have been charged with these th three utilities. I want to make that clear because there's been some comments out there that this is a brand new fee. And for water, wastewater, and solid waste, it's affirming that we're not charging more than rates, more than the cost. And one of the reasons why I recommended having this done as part of the 1315 budget was because the rates for water and wastewater are going up. I wanted to make sure that we weren't charging this general fund support more than a cost. So part of the reason for doing this was to make sure that we were not charging more. And what has turned out for these three utilities is we'll actually be charging less than what was included in the studies. I just want to make sure that's um, clear. Councilmember Mosby. Is that uh, the phased in numbers? Are those the phased in numbers? Correct. And those are the only two 
periods that anything has been decided on. We, you, as the governing board, will have a chance to give directions to staff through Patrick for the 17, 19 cycles and beyond. Yes, you're right. It is the first two phased in, which is why the amounts are moving from, from here to here. And what would, they, no, what would they look like if it was the, the full amount, the maximum amount? Well, it's about the same. So if you go up two, well, the, three, four years. But the phase number and also doesn't include transit in there. Did you have transit in there? I, I, I'm trying to show what the difference is on the three utilities they have rate setting authorities. So right, but those are the phase numbers. What what would be the, what would be the the, the number in here, the non-phase number? I mean, it would be a would it be at the graph or above the five percent? Not not the not what you've put down as recommended in here, but the um, uh, what do you call it here? The biggest number that you guys have in here. The well, final if you, enterprise fund reimbursement. If you decide to allow it to go all the way to the top, it would be this ten million one sixty two out within two to three budget cycles. But again, I'm not I'm say, stating that there's been no decisions made on seventeen, nineteen, nineteen, twenty one, twenty one, twenty three. So what's what I guess that's the deal. What what is the limiter that keeps it from going from that? You guys. Okay. Now what is the service, if it goes to that, is, is, the, is the service being provided to the enterprises doubling? One of the things that we discussed with the consultant is that th this number could be whatever it turns out to be, but if there's no ability to pay, then there's no ability to pay. So it's a decision that can be made as part of those budgets to say we want to have it at X. Um, the recommendation would be to back it up a step. The 10163 is a maximum. It doesn't say that we have to go to that. The, d the decision to determine what is the amount that you want to do is part of the budget setting process. And, and that's what I get about with the graph that you showed earlier. I mean, if you, you obviously if you had the, the, the green one there, up oh, there you go. Yeah. So if you put in the other side, you would actually see this to be um, quite a bit greater with, without the brakes being put on. That's, this is my point of concern is the budget becomes the driver, not the cost of the service being provided. So in other words, if, if, you know, there, there's this, it's almost like the sky's the limit, I'm not the sky's the limit, $10.1 million is the limit, yeah. which is a significant increase in the methodology and support is it's, it's, it's not the service, the cost of the service directly being provided. Right. And neither is the upper graph, which is based on 5% of revenues. Well, so that would go up based on the revenue stream as well. So you would probably continue to have a separation here, even in the, if you decide to have this implemented for 1719, there would probably still be a savings to the three rate, pay, rate setting utilities even through the end of that second cycle. And likewise, if the wastewater plant were to disappear, the general fund expenditure for public safety would stay the same. It wouldn't reduce if the, if the wastewater plant were to disappear. You would still have that, that same cost. You wouldn't lay somebody off because the wastewater plant disappeared. It's just, that, that's, it's not, you know what I'm getting at. Councilman Starbuck. Wouldn't an easier approach be to, instead of taking 5%, just make it 4%? I may have to, I may let John talk about that a little bit, but with the rates, the, the rates, I'll just use an example for water. If we continue the 10.5% increases for the next two years, there's no guarantee that if we looked at that, this, then the cost, using that is not substantiated, and especially by the Roseville decision, because if you're using a percentage, there's no way to tell if you're under cost. And we are, we've been using a percentage since 1997-98 with just the, the assumption that we wouldn't be going above the cost, but there was no continuing review to see if we were below cost, and that's exactly why we did this, to make sure that we're below cost. Okay, 
We're going to go to public comment right now. Those of you that wish to speak on this item, you have three minutes. Good evening. My name is Ron Fink, and I'm here to represent the Santa Barbara County Taxpayers Association. I'm also a resident of Lompoc. Santa Barbara County Taxpayers Association has carefully reviewed the staff reports and the uh, enterprise reimbursement fund study and several reference documents, and we've reached the following conclusions. <clears throat> we think that some level of cost reimbursement is reasonable and can be justified. However, the methodology used in the reimbursement study report relies totally on a position of establishing proportional fees which seem to contradict the court's finding in, in Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association versus the City of Roseville that's referenced in the report. The study doesn't meet the test of estab establishing reasonably represented cost rather than relying solely on proportional fees. The study employs a flawed methodology to determine re reasonably represented cost that neither the study nor the staff report established who paid for these facilities. Was it the general fund or was it the enterprise funds that paid to build the facilities? And that's an important factor in determining uh, how to charge funds. In order to convince us, the taxpayers and ratepayers of Lompoc, that the transfer of funds from a publicly owned and operated fee-supported utility to a general fund property tax sales supported service without a public vote is reasonable, you must develop a method that accounts for all the material and labor costs associated with the direct services that are provided. This is how you'd pay somebody if you're in business. If they come to uh, do your house, you know, modernize your house, cost and materials. Page 15 of the study, uh, the consultants say, the form of repayment is patterned after a methodology approved by regulatory commissions such as the Public Utility Commission by which investor-owned utilities are allowed to recover costs. I would remind you that in Lompoc, they are not investor-owned for-profit facilities. They are publicly owned facilities that operate at no profit, in theory. In the case of HCTA versus the city of Roseville, uh, the judge found that they had violated Section 6B of Proposition 218. A portion of that says, uh, a fee or charge shall not be extended, imposed, or increased by any agency unless it meets the following requirement. No fee or charge may be imposed for general governmental services, including but not limited to police, fire, ambulance, or library services, where the service is available to the public at large substantially in the same manner as it is to property owners. Uh, I've reached my time limit. Okay. And so, uh, Mr. Fink, I have a couple questions for you. Okay. Do you have any specific concerns with the proposal, and what would be your recommendations? Yes, I have quite a few. As a matter of fact, uh, we provided each of you an electronic copy of a letter from the Santa Barbara County Taxpayers Association. I provided a hard copy to the clerk. Uh, our analysis was fairly in depth. We picked this thing apart. Um, we know that the water, waste, water, and solid waste are subject to Prop 218 and electric subject to Prop 26. Okay. The authority to assess enterprise funds uh, specifies that no property related fee can be levied to pay for general, as I mentioned, for general public service. Uh, so we go down, we'll start with the assumptions portion of it. Now, in my professional life, I prepared a number of reports for the government. I responded to a number of our re requests for proposals, and every time we did, we always put in assumptions. The assumptions were alibis. The alibi was because the government didn't tell us everything they wanted. So this consultant is no different. He provided a number of things in here that were more or less alibis. For example, uh, on page seven, they say, well, they're, they're talking about 
Roseville case again, which I already discussed, so I won't waste your time on that. Uh, but in regard to the fees, um, they use the proportional method. When you actually have a tool available to you, which is called the master fee schedule, which establishes the costs that I would have to pay, say, if I had a permit issued to build something at my house, a permit fee, uh, and everything else, you have a fee schedule available. So there's a tool available to assess the appropriate fees to the general fund for service back to the utility. Okay. On page nine, they say, because public property is tax exempt, it has no assessed valuation. But you might recall a few months ago, you were discussing uh, relocating fire station two. Somehow, the city came up with a cost to rent that property. So there is a way to establish an assessed valuation for something because you already did it. Page eight, uh, talks about public safety uh, funds, saying the enterprise share of the cost associated with public safety should be commensurate with the services received. I agree. What are the services received? As uh, Melinda suggested, I pay property tax, and so do all of you that live in the city for our police and fire services. Okay, so why as a rate payer should I pay to maintain that standing force for something that I already paid to have the standing force available to respond to all these variety of things that could occur. And I believe Council Member Starbuck mentioned how many times do you suppose that the fire department is going to have to go zipping over to the wastewater treatment plant? They're probably not ever going to have to go there unless they go there for a fire inspection or something. So and it doesn't seem reasonable. Reasonable. Keep reasonable in mind. Okay, uh, as Council Member Mosby mentioned, it's proportional. It's all based on budget. It's not based on services provided. It's based on a portion of the budget. That's not a reasonable way to do this. Consultant also says that the city's inventory of its infrastructure may be incomplete. Okay, maybe you didn't tell them all the facilities you had, or maybe you didn't know. Uh, the same way with the dates that they were acquired. I mean, the, almost all of this stuff has existed here. I've, I've been here since 1975, and I remember distinctly going to training sessions at the wastewater treatment facility that existed in its current footprint in 1980. So it's been here for a long time. The airport, airport was transitioned to the city, what, in the late 80s, Wayne? Yeah. So it's been around for quite a while. Plus, they did a major runway extension and all the other improvements they've done. So, you know, we're kind of curious about how they arrived at these dates of, of how they were acquired. Okay. I mentioned the Public Utilities Commission, and it was for public uh, financed facilities that were bought and paid for for a for-profit institution. And of course, Lompoc, that isn't the situation here in Lompoc. We ratepayers own all of the stuff that serves us. Okay. Start talking about right-of-way maintenance on uh, page 20. Study says the Department of Public Works doesn't seek direct reimbursement from the enterprises for right-of-way maintenance. Why not? If they have to go out there and repair something that one of the enterprise funds, uh, for example, had to open a sidewalk or a street to repair something and the public works department goes over there once again, it's time and materials. How much time did it take them and how much materials did they use to fix that? That's a legitimate cost in, in our minds that could be transferred from the enterprise back over to the general fund. Not a, not a, a set percentage every year just in case they might dig a hole okay um, vehicle license there's other other ways to do right-of-way maintenance and collect funds for example 
the California vehicle license fees, all of the city vehicles, of course, are exempt. Uh, it would seem reasonable to the Taxpayers Association that if you determined what those fees would be if you had to pay them and you put that into a fund for street maintenance, that that might be a reasonable expense. The other way to do it is through gasoline sales taxes, which a portion of those go for street maintenance. The city doesn't pay tax on the fuel that it uses for the vehicle, so it would seem reasonable that if you use the amount of tax that would have been charged and send that over to street maintenance, that that might be a reasonable charge. There's also a U.S. Department of Transportation study. Uh, they have the Federal Highway Administration put out, uh, and they base their stuff on weight. So there are uh, acceptable methods available determine these costs, but proportional fees is not one of them. And that's that pretty much sums up our, our concerns with this particular thing, and we would uh, pose uh, this as it's been presented and suggest that you direct the staff to reaccomplish the study. Remind me never to ask you a question after your bedtime. It is. It's like way past my bedtime. And I don't know. Maybe those those other guys earlier, they took up all my bedtime. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank Fink. you very much. Next, please. Council, Mayor, John Lynn. Um, we had extensive discussions about this at the Utility Commission, and I think you may have gotten our resolution, but just in case, I brought a copy. I think it may have been included in the staff report, but I apologize, I didn't get all the way down to the bottom of the staff report. So I'm going to just talk about a couple of things because there are other speakers that we kind of divided this up so it made a little more sense. Um, with regard to the reimbursement for police and fire, I think Ron's absolutely spot on. The methodology is incorrect. And I think this little chart here makes it pretty easy to, to see the difference and what we have on here are a listing of the facilities and the vehicles that need to be protected by police and fire services. And then to the right is the charge. So you have to ask yourself if the solid waste division has a large landfill with a hazardous waste facility and a large storage yard with a hazardous waste facility and 11 heavy duty trucks that operate on an, an aggregate top end weight of about 44,000 pounds and four light duty trucks, would it be reasonable for them to pay $9,244 as opposed to a wastewater plant, which is a single facility, some collection lines that nobody can see and saboteurs really don't want to go after sewer lines, uh, two heavy trucks and five light trucks, should they pay $687,000? I think the question probably is, no, that's not an equitable way to do it. I think. Uh, there are better ways and frankly I would advocate for the council putting together a group, a group of citizens to take a run at this because we work for free and Jack Rodenhigh already volunteered. Uh, my job was to research the impact of utility cuts on streets and so I brought you these really two fat reports for the record. I don't expect you to read them. Instead, we excerpted the important pages out, and the one from Santa Cruz is kind of parallel to us because the weather is kind of similar. And probably the most exciting part about that is it nails it down to two separate factors. One, the age of the street, and then what the cost per square foot is for the repair. And it's really, really simple. Um, I also have here a copy of a study from Seattle. And what's kind of interesting about the Seattle study is it has a lot of um, individual studies that it's cited down below so that you have some other ones that could be used. And my time is up. If there's any questions, I won't answer them quite as long as Ron did because he, did, he covered most of it. Anything that I missed for anyone. Okay, thank you. Thank Next, you. please. Thank you. 
So my name is Jack Rodenheit, Lompoc resident. Enterprise Reimbursement Study, or ERS, commissioned by the city makes several claims of costs that are unsupported. For example, on the matter of public safety, because the value of the wastewater treatment plant is set at over $195 million, the study claims that the city actually spends over $687,000 protecting it each year. The ERS makes this conclusion based on an unsupported assertion that cost is incurred proportionally to the value of the property protected. Without an accounting of the people and equipment deployed, it's not possible to justify this charge. And it makes no sense. If the plant were suddenly removed from the city, you wouldn't expect the public safety budgets to drop by that amount. Charge is not supported by the ERS. I also want to address the cost of surface impacts to the right of way created by city enterprise fund activities. The ERS calculates that of the over $3 million in costs they attribute to vehicles, almost 829,000 or 26% is caused by refuse vehicles and over 580,000 or 18% is caused by transit vehicles. Since they did not disclose their methodology, it is only possible to judge the reasonableness of their results. The Department of Transportation has assessed what they call three R costs or road reconstruction, resurfacing, and rehabilitation costs for several kinds of vehicles. In their most recent year 2000 report, they found that a three axle vehicle weighing 50,000 pounds like our refuse vehicles would, in, would create an inflation adjusted 3R cost of about three, eight cents a mile, while a two axle vehicle like our Colt buses would occasion a cost of about 10 and a half cents per mile. If the refuse trucks cause costs at this rate, it would take over $10 million to incur the cost of the ER, that the ERS proposes. That's almost 22 trips, round trips to the moon every year, or an entire circuit of the 136 miles of streets in Lompoc every seven minutes. The transit buses would be making a complete circuit of town every 12 minutes. These are not reasonable results and call into question the methodology employed. The proposed costs are not supported by the ERS. Given the transaction costs the city's experience with an independent consultant, it would be wise to consider another option. I ask that the City Council appoint an ad hoc advisory board to meet and consider the evidence presented by the consultants and any other appropriate evidence to produce a reimbursement plan that is supportable where the ERS is not and one that is fair to the citizens of Lompoc. Thank you, Mr. Rodney. Anyone else? Good evening, Mr. Mayor and uh, council members. My name is Al Clark and I live here in Lompoc too. You've heard several well-reasoned and compelling arguments that, the challenge, that challenge the cost estimates in this reimbursement study, both from the utility commission's recommendation to you and from the citizens who came forth tonight. It's no secret that flawed assumptions and methods lead to erroneous results. In this case, they resulted in the contractor consistently overestimating the re reimbursements, sometimes by a factor of 10. This begs the question, how did a study this flawed get this far? And is it unreasonable for us to expect the city staff review would have found at least some of the problems the Utility Commission and public comments addressed? After reading this study, my conclusion was that the real purpose was to provide staff with an analysis that shows how $5 million can be added to the general fund in a way that would seem to break, not seem to break any laws and would avoid having to ask residents to vote on a sales tax increase. I'm just saying. For the enterprises that are supported by rate revenue, the study recommends that they increase the rates in order to replace the reimbursements. Thus, by overcharging the enterprises, you would force them to overcharge their customers. And seeing as how these reimbursements would impact our utility rates, it seems appropriate that this discussion would have included an estimate 
of the impact on our utility bills, but neither the study nor the staff report provide that information. So tonight, you are in the unenviable position of being asked to make a decision based on a flawed study and with no assessment of the financial impact it would have on your constituents. Here's what could happen should you adopt this resolution. Due to excessive reimbursements, sooner or later the enterprises that have rate revenue will cease being competitive with other public utility providers and the residents will rightfully demand that the city outsource those services. And outsourcing utilities would not be unusual. I've lived in nine cities in eight different states and Lompoc is the only one that provides four utilities, that is water, lights, trash, and sewer. In closing, I hope you all had an opportunity to review the 2014-2015 grand jury report on the city of Guadalupe's financial condition. That jury found the city had inappropriately transferred amounts from restricted funds to the general fund that were over and above reasonable allocations. In my opinion, adopting this analysis would be the beginning of your trip down that path that contributed to Guadalupe's financial woes. Can you wrap it up? So I ask you, in consideration of the hardworking people of our community, please do not adopt this resolution. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Next, please. Good evening, Jane Bear. I just want to thank uh, Council Member Mosby and Council Member Starbuck because I'm listening to you ask questions and it's clear to me that you are less concerned about what is legally defensible than what is actually fair. And I appreciate that. That is what I would expect city council members to be concerned about what is fair. And I certainly wouldn't blame the consultant because I think the consultant um, was, was given guidance to get as much money out, out of the utilities as they possibly could. So I, 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 can't, I can't blame this guy. I, I just think that it's good that we have folks who are elected and who are here to represent us who, uh, who are paying attention. And, and I can't even imagine how much work that is to sort through all that stuff. So I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Wiki Rodenhai. We have been told our city does not generate enough general fund revenue to support its current level of general fund services. You're being asked tonight to fund the shortfall by finding supplemental revenue in the city's enterprise funds. If approved, the enterprise fund departments will need to find more funds to replace this taking to operate their, the city's businesses. Ultimately, this issue will be funded by higher utility rates. We all remember how uncomfortable Lompoc was a few years ago with, a release, with the release of the grand jury report, a failure of oversight. I'd like to remind you of last year's grand jury report entitled, Guadalupe Shell Game Must End. The described circumstances sound very much like the evolution of what is proposed here tonight. The grand jury focused on what they called inappropriate interfund transfers between the city's special or enterprise funds and their general fund. Let me quote from the grand jury report. The city's many years of inappropriate transfers of restricted funds to the general fund were revealed in 2014. The inappropriate transfers of restricted funds included money intended for lighting, solid waste, water, and wastewater treatment funds. Generally accepted accounting principles allow a city to allocate a reasonable portion of its general overhead to the special funds 
in acknowledgement of the personnel time required to administer the funds. The amount allocated should be based on a documented cost allocation plan. Over the last 12 years, the jury estimates that these inappropriate transfer totaled millions. These funds should have been spent on specific product projects for which the money was collected, such as repairing streets and other infrastructure and building a reserve to handle emergencies. The money instead, inappropriately, was diverted to the general fund to pay for various city operations, such as police, fire, city council, <clears throat> administration, city attorney, parks and recreation, building maintenance, permits, and finance. The Guadalupe City Council has been using these general fund overhead allocations as a way to cover ongoing budget deficits. These interfund transfers could have been appropriate if the city had put in place agreements with repayment schedules. <clears throat> Excuse me. had put in place loan agreements with repayment schedules and the city council had approved them by resolution. Witness after witness confirmed that no such agreements exist and the city council never approved such loans. That's the end of my quote. This evening, we've heard from a variety of people who under other circumstances wouldn't be caught dead speaking in support of the same topic. Okay, it's okay, good need, to see. I need to wrap it up, Ms. Wodenheim. I urge you all to reject this inner fund transfer proposal. It's a slippery slope. Good evening. Okay, okay, thank you. Next, please. Pam Wall, local resident. I wasn't going to speak, but Ms. Bear, thank the council member Mosby and council member Starbuck for asking the questions. and. I thank you for bringing this back and not just signing off on it, but I'd like to thank the residents that spent considerable time digging into this and what they brought forward tonight. And I would support the recommendation. The staff has had their chance at this, and this is where we've gotten. I'll also mention that the maximum without sending out for an RFP for a consultant, I believe, is $30,000. And you mentioned that, actually, um, when you spoke, I think, in March, that it was just under $30,000. So maybe that was the intent. But please, take this out of their hands and let these, I would say, expert residents who have spent the time and trouble to dig into this and actually provide you with some valid information to take a shot at this before we go any further. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Bob Holloway. Uh, I just want to remind you that uh, if we pass this, well, the general fund will be taken care of because if we have a break or a, uh, have to repair any of the lines or anything like that, it's going to have to come out of the general fund because you're taking all our money away from us. So uh, I just wanted to let you know that, uh, um, you know, you, you got to think twice on how you're going to vote and everything. And I got one little thing here, you know, in about 1990, uh, the fire department uh, decided they didn't want to take care of fire plugs anymore, so we had to hire two guys in the water department to go out and take care of the fire hydrants, clean the weeds, paint them and everything, and make sure they were all right. So, you know, in this redistribution thing, you know, the water department is supposed to pay for public safety for the fire department when we're already doing our job. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Okay, seeing no one rise, we're going to close, close public comment. And I'm going to, Mr. Farmcroft, did you want to make any comments on public comment? Uh, yes, please. Uh, thank you. I'll try to be brief. Um, uh, a lot of things were said. Uh, let me begin with the, um, the reference to Article 13D, Section 6B. There are five subsections in 6B. Uh, the claim was made that uh, you can't set a fee 
to cover public safety costs that are already covered through taxes. Uh, you need to understand that the enterprise reimbursement study is not deriving a fee under that section of Prop 218. It's simply determining a portion of the costs that the general fund is providing to the enterprises. So it's not a fee. Um, the, the proper uh, section that should have been referred to uh, in the Roosevelt decision is section 6B1 and 2. The um, comment was also made that we're using a proportional method, and I'm not exactly sure what, how to understand that, but what we have been doing is uh, complying with Article uh, 13 uh, D, Section 6B3, that says that uh, fees, property-related fees, water, sewer, uh, solid waste, need to be proportional to the cost of providing service. Uh, that's Prop 218 is required to do that, and so we are proportioning these costs. Uh, to think that you should do it any other way is wrong. Uh, what we have not done, though, is approach this from the standpoint that we are trying to fill a hole in the general fund. Uh, we were never guided or requested to do that. The numbers that were presented tonight about what the current charges are, uh, this is the first time I've seen those. I didn't asked to see them before. I did not want to be influenced by knowing what those current charges were. We did a completely independent study, and we were not asked to try to come up with a methodology to fill a hole in the general fund. Well, I've taken two pages of notes, and I probably noted at least a couple of dozen things, and I don't know if you want me to go through those right now. It's already getting late. Sure. Okay. I want to thank you for your time. I also want to let you know that I think you're an honorable individual. Your, your firm is honorable, and I think you provided the information you, you were asked to provide, and I want to thank you for that. So. You're welcome. Okay. Okay. With that... Um, based on the discussion this evening, I, I want to move that we continue this item. I'd also like to include in my motion that we appoint an ad hoc committee consisting of Jack Rodenheim, a resident of Lompoc and a CPA, Ron Fink, a resident of Lompoc and a member of the Santa Barbara Taxpayers Association, Brad, Brad Wilkie, our city's finance director, Councilmember Mosby, and myself. This committee will take the study performed by the consultant, analyze it, and come back to the council in 60 days with a recommendation. That 60 days will be approximately July 19th. With that motion, I'd like a second. I'll second that, Mr. Chairman. Okay. In doing so, I was going to come in with the same thing with the advisory committee. You, you selected them. I think that's what the, a lot of good information came here tonight came from the, both from the council chambers and also from the audience. And I think by doing it, have an advisory, like you have set up a committee with the people there, uh, they'll come back with the recommendations that we can handle. Okay, we have a motion and a second discussion. Start with Councilman Mosby. Can you add with the, the notes and stuff that I guess you had some more of the comments or something that the consultant did for um, the public comment and stuff that that could be added to that as well? I believe so. Okay, Councilman Starbuck. One of the things that I, I would like to ask if you, this ad hoc passes is, is if we could compress it from 60 days, maybe to 30 or something, get it much sooner. I think that everybody that you've named has a pretty good idea what's going on here because this is going to directly affect the item that we just postponed. So uh, we wouldn't want to vote on a rate increase because we don't know what we're going to do with the enterprise reimbursement. So rather than put the rate increase out to 90 days, if we could do the rate increase in 60 days and the ad hoc in 30, I mean, maybe a compression or something along that line. Um, yes, except I have already spoke to at least one of the individuals and they feel 60 days would be appropriate. And we've already taken this out months and I'd rather do it, get it done right, 
excuse me, I, I'm not saying it wasn't done right. I, no, I really seriously. Um, but let's let's get all the weeds. No, out. I, I'm fine with that. I just like I say, I'm not comfortable going into the rate increases that okay. need to happen. Also, uh, Councilmember Vega. Yes, I'd like to thank all the people that were involved. You know, Mr. Rodenheim, Ron Fink, Alan Clark. All the people that spoke, Jane Bear, you know, this is what it's all about. This is what I like to, we're learning as we go, but for us to take our time and sort this out is the best way to go. And also I'd like to thank uh, Councilman Mosby and Starbuck for the extra questions actually uh, on their request. That's why they were very prepared. So that's good to see us. Before we uh, pretty much and in, in, in put in more increases without any substance or basis, okay, that we don't understand. I just, I, I just agree that we should understand what we do here instead of just saying yes. Okay, that's my comment. Thank you. Okay, so before I call for a vote, um, Mr. Farmcroft, oh, Councilman Mosby, thank you. Okay, yeah, I need to get on your better eye, I guess, over there. Um, just, just one thing I want to reiterate, that this, this is, uh, you know, very important that this, uh, this is something that's going to potentially be used for many, many years, and it involves tens of millions of dollars. This isn't a, a just, well, we were 5%, we're just going to go this way. When, you know, I, I really do think that it needs to be, um, you know, granted it's, it's, it's asking, uh, you know, more time for staff and more time for, for us as well, but it's, this is a significant movement that's going on here. It's not, uh, it's not just a, you know, not just a walk in the park. So before I call for a vote, um, I'll ask Mr. Farmcroft if you can share your notes with maybe Mr. Fink or Mr. Rodenheim, or maybe get them to us in an email? Yes, no, I'd be very happy to do okay, that. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, with that being said, uh, let's vote. And that passes 5-0. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's take a five-minute break. Okay. Okay. Um, Meeting is called back to order. We're going to go back to item number six. Um, yeah. yeah, we're ready to go. Uh, um, Mr. City Manager. Um, if, thank you, Mayor. If, if um, all the council's here, I'll wait. If... Um, if council's ready to make some consideration on on the rates, having just heard the discussion for item number seven and understanding that the orders of magnitude of how we uh, adopt rates and, and the contributing components are apparently essential issues, uh, that, that certainly was proved out by all the comments that were there. I think that reflects that. Then. Uh, I appreciated particularly Member Starbucks' observation that even processing through something like a 60-day uh, window on, on the um, reimbursement analysis report impacts the rate adoption. And waiting even one month, waiting even 30 days without doing any implementation of the rate would have an impact on the utilities that far outweighs even the most extreme um, ends of what might be covered within the, within the uh, reimbursement analysis report. So even if you took extreme positions from one to the other, you couldn't cover as much as what's going to be impacted by a delay in the adoption of rates um, by even one month. Uh, so if you, I assume the orders of magnitude are critical issues or we wouldn't have spent that much time discussing and now preparing this much uh, analysis going forward on the reimbursement analysis report. Therefore, I recommend to you that you proceed and approve and adopt the, uh, the rates as presented with the exception and that we might pull out that component of the rate that is n so that the only a, um, amount of adjustments to the utility rates 
are that which is not reflected in the reimbursement analysis report. So going forward, your ad hoc committee is going to examine the reimbursement analysis report, find what is the appropriate components of charges. And so what I'm suggesting is for the balance of, of the rest of, of the adjustments that would have been attributable to everything else that you would go ahead and, and uh, approve those recommendations. And we'll subtract out anything that's reflected within the reimbursement analysis report. Thank you. Councilman Mosby. I can agree with moving forward with uh, the item number six because I think it's important that we put it on the table because money that potentially is lost here has got to be made up somewhere else. So delaying this further, I, I believe it needs to. If there is an adjustment through the enterprise reimbursement analysis, I feel that that can be done after the fact. Um, however, I think if we move forward this way, I would like to take these uh, one at a time the water one at a time, wastewater one at a time, and solid waste one at a time, and, and move through them. Because I think there's um, significant reasons to do different things for each one of those. Go ahead, take the first one. Take the first one, we'll take... Uh, and by the way, we've already had public comment on this. So this is just, we've continued it. So this is the uh, council discussion um, after public comment. Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, um, the, the water charge that we implemented last year, we heard that we had approximately 45 to 50% is what we recovered with the charge that we put through. And it seems that we're down a vicious cycle by putting increases on uh, the units. When, we, when people have the opportunity to conserve out, that's what's happening. And what ends up happening is we have to raise it again. And what ends up happening, we raise it again. And then we penalize people um, for using the service, the reduced quality of life. We've already seen lawns all around going, going brown. And people, um, you know, I, I hear people talking about, uh, you know, the, holding back in their house multiple, multiple times before they flush and, and moving into the conservation aspect significantly. So what is happening is we raise the rate on the, on the unit of water, people can serve more, we need to raise it more. And it kind of shows with the last uh, rate increase that we had of 7.5% when we got barely 45% of what we achieved. In any book, when you do you know something like that, uh, that's, that's a failure. And I believe that what we should have done, and as the consultant had said in the past, it was important if you want to get your rate, you put more on the meter and less on the unit of water. Um, where I know it's difficult for the people in town, but I also know it's difficult for the enterprises to keep going. And we need uh, this revenue um, for specific reasons. And in, in my situation, in looking at this, is 23.6% that they're asking is the total. If there's a component of that that, of course, is the water unit charge and a component of that is the meter charge. And my recommendation is to not do any increase on the unit charge because you're, getting, you're not getting the revenue. You just keep raising the rate and you're not giving it. Where you would put the increase on the meter charge, um, because I know the city's trying to achieve a certain goal, and it seems kind of foolhardy to keep going out and doing something that's not working. Um, and there is a chart, I don't know, uh, that breaks down. I don't know if you guys have some numbers on, on meter charges, but there is one that, that was out there from, from the original hearing on August 3rd, 6, 2013. And my recommendation is, of course, with continued discussion, is that we, we, we don't put increase the unit charge of the water in it, because we are penalizing the people for using the service in the aspect of, of the rate. And people are finding a way to conserve out of it, so we're not gaining what we need to but if we did it, just the movement of the meter charge, and as an example for the 5 8 meter, as written um, July 1st, 2015, it was a $31.36, and raising that to 3606 as for 7 1 2016, um, which we would pretty much get 100% of that, um, unless somebody wasn't paying their bill. But if we could do, get 100% of it, 
I think that's important. Granted, there's probably going to have to be another 218 study as things progress because we're going to see that there's, there's more money going down. But that's my recommendation. Any other discussion? Oh, City Manager, do you have a comment on that? Um, well, you heard my recommendation. My recommendation is for both the meter charge and the um, and the volumetric charge that you would um, adopt the proposed amounts less the component that is being studied regarding the reimbursement analysis report. Okay. Any other discussion? I need a motion. Uh, this is just on the water. I would make a motion to move forward as, as my suggestion was to, to not raise the unit charge on the water, but to move forward and as per this chart, I believe those are the numbers where we are. Am I on the right chart? And to move forward with the, the meter charges as per the, per the study, but not with the per unit charge. That also does make up for the, there was a, a degree of, of charge that we didn't charge last time. There was a the little percentage as well. There's 7.5% on the meters we didn't. Right, so the, this so would bring, bring us up on the meter charge, but not doing, you know, that's, that's my motion, so I need a second. That's I'll give a second. Okay. Just a question, what would the meter charge be then? What's on the, uh, the meter charge would be what is on the first resolution in 2013. So it would depend upon the meter itself, but. Um, could, I, could I just have a minute to look at this real fast? I just. Go ahead. Can, can I just state to sure, you. Sure, go that ahead. The, um, because the meter charge is a third of the makes up, the, the, the volume is about two thirds and the meter charge is a third. Um, so that would be about 8.5% overall versus the 23.63 the that we were recommending. And if I, and if I could answer that, if you, if you do increase the water unit charge, you're not going to get what you want because people are just gonna stop using water that much more. I think it was proven the last time when we tried to do that, you probably did get the meter charge last time and you probably got people using that much less water and people in this town are afraid to use water which eventually down the road you're going to see the effect on the wastewater and it might take two three four years so you're chasing your own tail again and we're going around and around we know we know what we need to get and and, and if i'm still on this council in the future i will be highly supportive that we know how much money we need to get and we know to go to the best methodology to get that money and not force conservation by raising rates I guess my last question here would be, would this get us to where we need to be in this enterprise fund in water if we did just the meter? To get us where we need to be is we need the 23.6% increase. Um, to, <laughs> and that, that's what the uh, consultants suggested in, in uh, 2013 when we reviewed it. Um, so or things like the drought that people have used less water because of that and and to save costs they've used less water so what would the percentage increase be with the meter then for the t increase in meter the 23 percent increase in the meter component it would be an 8.5 percent increase overall that's 8.5 guaranteed though yeah okay which would in turn to the revenues be almost three times what you got last time with the last increase. So I'm, I'm giving you a significant, I mean, and granted, I know it's difficult for the people, but to stop chasing our tails and not getting what we're needed to get anyways. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? This could, we, could we repeat the motion real quick, please? Mr. Mosby. We waive the increase on the unit of water charge, but put implement as per the chart here for the meter charge. Is everyone clear on that? Okay. okay. Any further discussion? What's for? Okay, that passes 5-0.
Okay. So, so just for the record, you adopted the resolution that's here with the amendments to reflect what you just did, right? No. So we don't have to bring the resolution back. Do, we're, do, going to, we're going to amend the resolution correct. To, to do what you just approved, but we're not going to bring a resolution back. We just passed the resolution as amended. Yes. That is my understanding, Mr. Councilman Mosby? Yes, okay. Okay, next would be wastewater. Well, you know, I guess wastewater still. Go ahead. Yeah. You want me to fire away on that one? Go ahead. I, as much as I've heard people say that we are in dire needs of not raising the wastewater rate, I can't see any other way out of it. Um, we do have a hundred plus million dollar facility there that needs to be uh, taken care of. We do have a hundred and some odd miles of sewer lines and we do have a reserve balance we need to come up with. And as much as I would like to not make a recommendation we didn't make that increase, I think we, we have to make the, the recommended increase as per um, the resolution. Do we have a second? I will second it. And we have discussion. Let's vote. That passes 4 1 with 1. Yes. Okay. Uh, solid waste. Mr. Mosby. You're on a roll. I'm on a roll. I love it when other people recommend rate increases. I, well, <laughs> that was already passed by you a number of years ago. I'm just, <laughs> um, again, with solid waste much the same as the wastewater. We do have a gas collection system mandated by APCD. We have a significant expense and we have some past debt that's still being paid off. And I believe um, we have to go with the uh, staff recommendation of the resolution as written. That's 3.5, I believe, wasn't it? 3.6. 3.6. Yeah. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Discussion. Let's vote. That passes four one. I believe that takes care of that. Melinda, is that that takes care of that one? Okay, let's move on to item number eight. This is award a contract to transit systems operating services. This is Mr. Fernbaugh. Mr. Mayor, member of the council, staff recommendation to award the contract for the RFP 16-T1-01 to RMS Management Services for approximately $5.4 million over the next five years and to authorize the city manager to execute that contract. Contract with our current operations provider, Store Transit Services, expires June 30th. Therefore, in March of this year, we released an RFP to select a contractor for the next contract period. Two proposals were received and opened on March 24th. Two proposals were store, our current contractor, and RMS Management Services of Camarillo. Both proposals were evaluated and both interviews, both vendors were interviews as part of the selection process. Uh, the evaluation panel uh, scored both proposers uh, to be responsible and qualified transportation management companies. However, when the points were tallied, RMS received the highest rating by the panel. During the transition period, RMS will offer all current store employees who meet employee requirements the opportunity to transition to the RMS team as required under California Labor Code. Financial impact over the next five years, approximately $5.4 million uh, will be the cost at the proposed beginning revenue rate of $50.52 per hour compared with stores proposal of $65.94 per hour. The savings between the two with RMS receiving the contract will be approximately $1.6 million over a five year period. Staff recommends RMS be awarded the transit contract in accordance with 
Municipal Code Section 3.36.04, uh, contract funded out of account number 23,000-53449. Term of the contract is five years uh, with two additional years uh, available if mutually agreeable by both parties. Questions? The two years additional, that's at the current contract that we'd be signing? Right. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Fernbaugh? Okay, we'll open this up to public comment. I'm a local resident. I just have a question. You just raised the rates on transportation in town, and you have to meet, what was it, 20 percent, and we were meeting three. What happens if we don't? Do they have to shut down? I mean, what happens? Well, I think you're going to have a lot fewer riders, so it'd probably get worse. You're signing a contract for five years, so I'm, I'm just curious. Okay. Um, Thank I'll you. Take, okay, I'll real briefly try to answer that. Um, we have, yeah, Richard, do you want to try and answer that? Good idea. <laughs> yes, as I stated, the current contract runs out June 30th. Uh, if we don't have a contract in place, then our current contractor has stated that they will not continue uh, under the next option year. So we would be out of service. Okay. I don't think that quite answers her question. Um, her question was, um, if we increase rates and we don't have any riders, are we just going to go out of business for our bus service? Yeah, the increased rates were just on ADA service and the Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara shuttle. Um, there is no increase on rates on our regular fixed route service. Will those stay the same? Okay, good. Any other public comment? I'm going to close public comment, bring it back to the council. Um, staff recommendation. Okay. Staff recommendation? I'll second it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Now let's vote. That passes 5 0. Okay. Item number nine, uh, this is request for additional funds to purchase mobile data computers and dash cameras for patrol vehicles. Uh, Police Chief Pat Walsh. Thank you, Mayor, City Council. Uh, <clears throat> this is a request to ask for an additional $67,602.56. I'll summarize uh, uh, the request. Last June, I came and asked for dash cameras and uh, mobile data computers inside the police cars, and you granted uh, $107,000 uh, for MDCs and $118,000 for dash cameras. We then put together RFP, put it out in December, and Captain Larder's here. He put together a, uh, a team to vet the vendors. Uh, we pushed it out to 90 vendors, and we came up with the two vendors and the, uh, the MDCs end up costing an additional $48,890.56, and then the cameras were an additional $18,712 over what we requested. And so uh, we would really like this technology. Uh, I, I said that last summer, and uh, we just had we didn't have, we didn't put an RFP to get our bids. We just got bids to come and, and ask for what we wanted. We did, uh, uh, we did make a mistake on the MDCs and, and some of that is ours and, and our technical advisors. But uh, that's, you know, a year old bid. So that's why it's $67,000 more. Okay, uh, Councilmember Vega. Chief, um, this was from our previous amount of money that we passed, correct? I mean, this is what we need to shore up the deal and, and basically get you what we wanted to get you in the, the first time. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Starbuck. 26 months 
it's an odd figure. Why, is there something that we're required to hold 26 months of data for each of these? Well, that's the standard because we can, you know, for court uh, evidence and also for being lawsuits, civil liability, that kind of stuff. So, and, and there's different retentions. You know, if there was a, a violent crime or something and we got a piece of that on the camera, we would keep that a lot longer. Any homicide cases, we would keep that forever. You know, so there's, it kind of averages out. The day-to-day -day stuff we keep, uh, we would like to keep it for two years. Some departments keep it 12 months, uh, but if it gets a race at 12 months and you get sued at 14 months, you don't have it. Yeah, I'm just, I'm educating myself real quickly here. Isn't there a way you could download those computers into something and then continue a cycle or after 26 months it just goes away or it's, you know, I'll defer to the expert here. He spent a lot of time talking to the folks that came and talked to us. Yeah, just a visitor here. <laughs> so the industry, industry standard is 24 months to hold video. So a lot of in, what, for example, the Sheriff's Department, they found that their county council recommended that they hold their material for at least three years. They could be sued up to two years for whatever type of an action it is, civil action, or whatever type of action it's going to be. And this gives them some time to, to make that request go through their bureaucracy to actually extrapolate that video or that audio recording that's going to be needed for court to defend themselves against a false arrest for a DUI investigation, for example. And then they will be able to go ahead and present that in court. So they're giving themselves about two months of playtime after the 24 months to actually get this material um, and then hold on to it as it makes its way through the process of the Sheriff's Department. <clears throat> in contacting other agencies, they're doing the same thing. They're at about 24 months and then they give themselves a month to two months afterwards for retention. So the question is, can we download it off the servers? Yes, we can, but then we'd have to have some type of other internet or uh, if it's internet related, it's gonna have to be CJIS compliant, criminal justice information system compliant which can be expensive. If we have another type of a database at the agency, then we're gonna go ahead and have to buy a whole new database and a whole new, basically an interface to make this system work with the other system to download, download it once it loops around to the 26 month period. Or if we just go to 24 months to the 24 month period onto this database. It's kind of like having, in the old days, two re cassette recorders. You want to record off of one to the other, you have to have two different systems. Have you got room for all this? Uh, we were asking for a new police station eventually. <laughs> That's coming in the CIP. <laughs> if you asked. If, if you're talking about, if I, if I may, if you're talking about room for storage and all of that. Equipment, I think you're saying. Well, we, besides that, but the, there's a separate component of this that we just want to make sure we divulge that because um, we'll, we'll eventually have to come back with physical storage space as well. I probably estimated some, somewhere around we thought 160,000 or something like that, but that's not what you're being asked to. We, we want to make you aware that, that is a, that's, that's a component of this eventually, but that's not what we're presenting tonight. Tonight we're presenting for the the hardware, if you will, up front. Yes, sir. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, let's go to public comment. Good evening, Jane Bear. Um, Chief Walsh and I were having a friendly disagreement earlier at Chow Ya um, about whether or not you can spend forfeiture money on this request. And, um, and Chief Walsh thinks that, that you can't. Um, I think you can. Um, and you may still decide that the best use of the money the forfeiture money is to spend it on an armored vehicle, which I'm pretty sure Chief Walsh doesn't want me to call it an armored vehicle. He wants me to call it a rescue? Rescue vehicle. 
rescue vehicle. So I, I'm not speaking against the rescue vehicle, but, but I guess I would like to get our facts straight about whether or not you could actually spend forfeiture money on this. Um, the, in, in the staff report for the rescue vehicle, you, um, it, it said that you can't use the forfeiture money for anything that's been under consideration or partially funded. And I, uh, Chief Walsh and I looked over the document together and I, I didn't see that. Um, anything that the purpose of the, the rules that the Department of Justice put out is so that you don't basically say, oh, we got $250,000 for the police department, so now we're going to take away two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So you you're giving them extra money, and in my opinion, you can use the forfeiture funds to do that. And that's what I believe this document says, and I've highlighted it. This would be useful to you also when you're considering the rescue vehicle. Um, because I don't think we've had enough time to think about whether or not we want a rescue vehicle in our community. I think that's controversial. And, um, and Chief Walsh has gone away, as I have to admit, to con convincing me. And you see, I'm calling it a rescue vehicle, so I'm already halfway convinced. He said he'd bring a picture. I don't know if he did. But I, I think you need to know what else this money could be spent on. And the document that I've given you there has permissible uses. It could be used for community um, education. It could be used for gang violence. It could be used for investigations. It could be used for overtime. All of those that are listed as permissible uses. So I guess I just want you to make, a, 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 in the interest of transparency, I, I want you to consider all your options, and one of the things you could spend this money on is the CAMs that you're being asked to consider in this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm a local resident. I've been badged. <laughs> um, I, I'm sure the city attorney will give you a legal answer on what money can be spent for this, but I would support this. I think people across the nation would like to see these cams in our police cars. And it's both for our police officers as well as the public. So I personally support this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, we're going to close public comment, bring it back to the council. What's your decision? Oh, Chief? Well, I, I, just, I just want to comment on, on the money. Uh, yeah, I could use federal forfeiture money for items, um, but I'm going to talk about that in the next item as well, so I don't know if you want me to talk about it now or wait. Well, I guess the question is, could you use it for the cameras? I, I don't think we can because what the, what the uh, DOJ says is you can't use it for budgeted items and you already budgeted this for me a year ago, although I haven't spent the money yet. So it's kind of a legal question. We, might, we both might be partially right. So, um, and, but if I spend it on this, then I can't, I, we, we might as well not talk about the next item because we won't have enough money for the next item. Yeah. Councilman Starbuck. Well, we, we didn't budge or budget for the uh, vest cameras. Would the use, could we use that money for the vest cameras then? Uh, the body worn cameras are a lot. Uh, you need a bike. I can't remember what they were. Do you, do, you have a, do you have a current bid on body cameras? No, not an official bid, but it'll be a little over 150000 Yeah. So not including the storage. Would those share the same storage? Yeah, they share the same. Well, you'd need a lot more storage. Right, but more they can cameras, share more, the same. More cameras, more storage. More depth, but yeah. if we were able to use them for the body armor cameras and then the storage, it would be a mutual benefit for everybody at this point, right? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, the jury's out for me on body-worn cameras for a couple reasons. One, they, uh, it's not like the cop show. It's put your camera on a string and swing it around that's your that's the kind of video you're going to have in court uh there's a lot of 
police departments have gone to them and have quit using them because they can't afford the storage of all of that data. And I personally think in the next 10 years, we're going to be mandated to go to them. We might as well wait and see if they're going to bring some money along with that because they are very expensive. And then every five years, we have to replace them. So that's a, that's a pretty big to crack. Councilman Humdall. Well, to follow up on that, you still want this to be settled tonight on this one. Each one is going to be separate. Where the funds come from will be two separate agencies. Correct. Then I'd go ahead and move the recommendation. Got, so. I'm going to comment from city manager. I'm sorry. Well, I hate interrupting a, a movement to <laughs> approve that. You should have turned your light off then. Yeah, no kidding. If I'd only known. Uh, I, I just wanted to say that the, these cameras and body cameras are two different issues. Chief uh, touched on just some of the concerns. I have some other concerns about uh, body-worn cameras as well. We can get into those another time. But it is uh, same type of storage, but additional storage and additional expense. That, that part being aside, uh, I, I've been steadfast in uh, my support of making sure we get dashboards, get computers online with the units, uh, do be able to keep track of, of our officers out in the field and be able to respond to them and back them up. Uh, with with quick notice and then be able to uh, to uh, to have the tools to be able to prove out some of our cases and chases so I just wanted to uh, say I, I recommend your approval here and we'll we'll no doubt be picking up the discussion of of the body worn cameras at another at another time just one other question here. How come we cannot use the impact fee resources for 100% of this? Well, because impact fees are for additional new coverage and expenses as opposed to equipping. This is upping the equipment of our current force. Councilman Mosby. I was getting ready to second Councilmember Okay, Councilmember Mos Council Humdahl. Yeah, I'm, the reason I moved to support this because I was supportive when we first came before us a year or two to, that you needed it. And I've seen a lot of programs and a lot of things have shown where that body camera does work out of the camera. And so that's why I was very much supportive. Are you, are you making a motion? motion? Yeah. That's my motion to do staff's recommendation. Okay, and I need a second. Second. Discussion. Let's vote. Okay, congratulations, thank you, that passes. Uh, stay there, Chief. We're going on to item number 10. This is request for request to use asset forfeiture funds to purchase an armored rescue vehicle and adopt resolution 6038, parentheses 16. Chief Walsh. So this is a pretty long staff report. I'm gonna summarize it as well. And so what I'd like to do is start with what we currently have. And, uh, what we have is, uh, is an armored personnel carrier from 1978. Uh, you won't see a picture of it tonight because when we went to move it out of the garage to take a picture, it wouldn't start. <laughs> um, and uh, it's, it's an APC is made to put 18 to 25 year old soldiers in it and move it around. And if it gets hit by an IED or uh, RPG, it's configured to try and deflect some of that. It's not made for police work. Uh, I can't put my SWAT team in it. <clears throat> Matter of fact, you, you put all that gear on, try and get into the thing, it's kind of difficult. They actually help each other into the vehicle. Uh, it's difficult to drive. Uh, you have to stick your head out in the wind. It's kind of cool to drive, but it's, it's very difficult to drive. If you want to be safe, you got to be down. You look through a little slit in the window. It scares me to death that we drive it around in that configuration. Uh, it was really made for off-road in a war zone, not made for an urban environment. Um, it's armor, and armor is supposed to stop bullets. And that's a picture of a, a military one. Uh, we don't have all the doodads and the, and the machine guns on top, but that's what we have. And, you know, if you're standing in between the wheels there to put armor between you and, a, and, and a, somebody with a rifle, they could shoot you from the knee down, and that, you're, you're going to be taken out of, uh, out of the equation there if you get shot. Armor needs to go down so that you can get behind it. 
Um, you can't really rescue anybody. If you rolled up on that, hopefully you wouldn't run them over because you can't see. But then you got to get out of that vehicle and push them back up in there, and that's three feet off the ground, and it's just not doable. It's it's not that little door comes down, and if you don't pay attention, you'll drop it on somebody's head, and it's all armored. It really is a heck of a heavy door. So I'm not real impressed with this vehicle. It's a great museum piece. Um, it's not a rapid deployment vehicle. If you go 50 miles an hour, it's scary. Uh, we, uh, we did a search warrant uh, on the MS-13 case for San Maria about a month ago, and, and I've done thousands of entries as a narcotics officer and, and some pretty scary ones too. That was probably the scariest one in my career I've ever seen, and we did it without a piece of armor. Uh, we had to do it, and those guys were bad guys, and the guy we went after was a shooter and a murderer, and so um, I was a little frustrated that I didn't have a piece of armor for my SWAT team. Um, I would love to, so that's what we have now. That, to me, is a military vehicle. Can you, uh, can you put the next one up? Just so you know what we're talking about. That's it. It's a... It's a it's a piece of armor. It's a rescue vehicle, but it's a piece of armor. Everything's armor, and you can shoot at that all day long and uh, sit inside, and, and you're going to be okay. It'll take 50 caliber rounds, which nobody has 50 calibers. If they do, um, it can take it. Uh, what this does is it allows us to move a, a team, a SWAT team or a narcotics team, into a location. You see all the benches there. We could put all of our equipment in there. It's actually made to carry all that weight. It's carrying a lot of weight already. We have uh, uh, two ambulances we got from the military when they, when they phased out of the military. And we have r rifles and cases of ammo and heavy equipment in it. We have no business driving those, uh, those ambulances with all that weight in it. This vehicle can take the weight. And it allows us to, to go to a situation, put it between the house and us if we have a hostage negotiation going on, and we can slow everything down. And that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the key. My, uh, any, any SWAT commander would tell you, or any chief would tell you, uh, all calls, <clears throat> what we want to do is reach, reach a negotiated peace, and this allows us the ability to get up close and personal, behind cover, even inside of it. We've negotiated over the phone in Portland, sitting inside, looking in the window of the house with the guy with the rifle. Um, we've used these vehicles to roll up on people that are shot and down and pick them up and scoop them and go. And that includes citizens, that includes police officers, and quite frankly, a guy named Dow shot and killed my friend in Portland, and we went and rescued him with that vehicle right there, with a vehicle just like that. So it's, we can rescue suspects too. And that's, the, that's our job. Our job is to rescue people. Um, I could give you story after story about that. I won't bore you with that, but um, I, I make no apologies that I want an armored vehicle. It's really important that you know that I'm not here to ask for a toy. I'm not asking for a toy. I'm asking for a piece of equipment. And I, I get it, it's a lot of money, but we seize a lot of money, and this is kind of, in my opinion, this is a one-shot opportunity to take that amount of money and buy something like this. There's a lot of other technology that we can spend this money on, I get it. But if we have an active shooter or a terrorist attack or something, I, I wanna be able to go in the back of that police station right there, jump in that thing, and get busy, and, and get over to whatever needs help. I, I had the, uh, privilege of <clears throat> listening to the San Bernardino police chief and the sheriff and the agent in charge from the FBI of the San Bernardino shooting and these things were critical and it was the police officers that went in and got people and brought them to the triage for the firefighters to work on them. So it's just important. My, I'm your police chief. My job is to keep the community safe and I know I'm asking for a big amount of money uh, that we have sitting in an account and and I don't think just because we seize it we should be able to spend it but if we're going to spend it we ought to spend on something that we just are never going to budget for so I am available for questions again Captain Lardner is my uh, SWAT commander mm -hmm. and he did a, a tremendous amount of research and so he's available for technical questions as well you know, Chief, if I'm a bad guy and you pull up in front of my house with that first one, I'm going to throw up my hands. 
<laughs> it does look kind of ominous. If you pull up with this thing, I'm going to order You'll milk. probably order milk. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Councilmember Vega. Chief, with this vehicle, in the case of uh, heaven forbid, you know, we have multiple shootings in a school or an auditorium or something here. I mean, would this vehicle be a deterrent? And would you com consider that an asset if we were to ever have something like that from another city? I mean, would that actually get us more prepared? Yeah, I think so. We, it, has all, it has all the equipment in it. It has armor. Uh, we could drive straight over train link fences and get right up to the buildings. We could put it between kids and shooters and, um, and it could, it can go down the freeway at a good clip. So, um, it's be a, a great preventive, me preventative measure for our city. I think so. In, in case and, we had some sort of a catastrophe happen, uh, like I say, again, heaven forbid that we ever have something, but at least we're not sitting there like sitting ducks. I, uh, yeah, I, yes, the, the answer is yes. And just so you know, I, I have done some research. I've talked to Ralph Martin from Santa Maria, the police chief there. I've talked to the sheriff. And we, nego we talked about how, how can we get armor to pieces of, you know, parts of the county. And we're kind of an island here. You know, there is armor in Santa Maria and there is armor in Santa Barbara, but it's not going to do us any good if something happens, mm -hmm. you know, down the street here. Gotcha. Thanks. Councilmember Mosby. You've got in the report here approximately $200,000 for the cost on this. And I was going online and looking, and, and the ones that I saw that were 50 caliber capable were on the $300,000 mark. Is, do you have this, something? This I mean, is approximate. I mean, what are we looking? I mean, no, this is the, pretty solid at 200. This is the Kia model. This is in the Mercedes. Um, if you want to see a really expensive one, you can go to Santa Barbara City or Santa Maria. They bought the, I think it's called the Lorenco. Lenko. Lenko. Uh, but it's it's good. It'll do. It's you know uh, the MRAP, which is a, a bigger uh, a machine that the military uses, is seven hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. We can get one of those for free right now. But it's again three feet off the ground. It's going to destroy. What's our... the right of way maintenance cost on that one? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> two hundred thousand a mile. I hear. Yeah. I just, I'm just, my curious, we're, you're pretty solid with that 200,000. I mean, the approximate, I mean, you're pretty. Yes, sir. If we go to the manufacturer and pick it up ourselves, absolutely. Otherwise, they want to charge us a little of $9,000 for delivery. Where did you have to go? It's going to be. I saw some of these in Nigeria. Dearborn Heights, Michigan. Okay. I saw some in Nigeria for sale. I wanted to uh, see how far <laughs> you were going. But... This is an MRAP that weighs, it starts at about 43,000 pounds for the stripped down version of uh, metal uh, armor wise i'm talking about and one from what i'm looking at here is about 63 to 69 thousand pounds uh, we can get them for free but we're running into the same problem like the chief said that we already have we're getting something that's uh, not going to be it's not going to work on our city streets and mr bean won't be happy when we start busting lines water lines sewer lines due to the weight of this thing I, I just wanted to confirm the $200,000 mark because you did say approximate. I didn't, but yes. I got you. I'm they holding you too. We're going to take out that big salary you got. Absolutely. Anything above, right? You got it. Okay. Okay. Public comment. John Lynn, uh, historian on our existing armored car. Uh, we, we went to Santa Maria and picked it up at no cost to the city and brought it back and police officers refurbished it. It was given to us and it was better than nothing because we had nothing. Now we have an opportunity to have something that will really do the job. So I support the chief in his effort. I would love to be able to spend that money somewhere else. But, you know, we had an active shooting a while back and that would have been pretty golden. And I'm sure it's going to happen again. So. I don't know what we're going to do with the old one, but maybe we can make some museum money out of it. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Good evening. Jane Bear. Here again, I am not arguing against having a rescue vehicle. I, I would, I guess, wonder 
why can't we get the cheaper one where it doesn't stop 50 cal bullets because I don't think anybody has 50 cal bullets around here so I you know again I th <laughs> I think that I think that it's worth thinking about and and the reason is because maybe you do want a rescue vehicle maybe you could get one for 180 maybe you could get one for 150 and because not everyone um, knows what is in the packets that I gave you, I just want to read a couple other things that you could do with this money. You could use it for reward money um, to encourage people to turn in criminals. You could use it for the improvement of law enforcement or detention facilities. You could use it for all sorts of other high-tech toys that would help the police officers do their jobs. You could use it for 9-11, call center equipment. You could use it as matching funds for a grant, which would leverage the money. So you could get a grant for a million dollars and and have that much more money in in uh, in the police officer's budget. So leveraging the money seems like a really good idea. Um, you could hire a grant rent writer with with that money, to, to write the grant, to use the matching funds, to leverage the money. You could use it for drug and gang education and other awareness problem, uh, awareness programs. You could um, support community-based programs. I, I found it interesting, you could actually um, have a budget of 25, up to $25,000 a year that you could give to any community-based organization that was working with law enforcement on gang problems, on, you know, keeping kids employed so they don't get into trouble. So that's another substantial use. I, again, I don't, I don't know about the rescue vehicle, but, but I know that 50 cal is, is excessive. I was on the USS Cimarron in the Gulf um, during the first Gulf War, and uh, it was an oiler. It was 600 feet long, and that was our top capacity, the you know, 50 cal weapons. But I, I know what those look like, and I, I know that nobody in Lompoc has them. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Bring it back to the council. Councilman Mosby. A question for the captain, or chief, both. How, how many other vehicles did you look at? I mean, how, how, how I mean, you probably have the magazine in your. There, there are two primary manufacturers in, in America. One is Lenco, which is what Santa Barbara Police Department has. That's the, that's the high end, that's the luxury vehicle that can run into three, four, five hundred thousand dollars. Um, then there's the Armored Group, which is the other organization who has a very similar vehicle. They're, it depends on what options you get on them. They're both minimum rated at 50 caliber. You go up from there. So you can get more armored if you choose to. The minimum is 50 caliber. Um, so, and then there's Oshkosh, which is foreign, and they're more of a, uh, a Humvee type of vehicle. That is uh, a four or five passenger vehicle. Um, that type of a body style, more of like a, a, a Jeep-looking vehicle with big tires Which on it. Which is a little more tactical. You're, this is more rescue. Yes, this is more rescue. This has more doors. You're able to open the doors in the back and, and actually grab people and pull them in. You can put skirts on the sides, uh, bullet-resistant skirts. Um, you're able to stand up in the center and actually look out if you have to. Uh, LED lights, a lighting system where you're able to light up for example, we had the shooting over on, uh, I think it was Poppy, 500 block of Poppy, um, where you're able to light up an entire area with these types of vehicles. With the Oshkosh, and there's a couple of other armored vehicle companies in America, but they produce vehicles that are uh, like a Suburban. You know, you want to up armor your Cadillac or your, your limousine, something like the Beast, like what uh, the president drives around in. Those type of organizations are out there that beef up regular vehicles. And there's only a couple out there that actually produce vehicles that are made for law enforcement. And that's Lenko and Armored Group. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Councilman Starbuck. 
Yeah, I'm just going to make a couple of comments here. You know, a lot of people are intimidated with law enforcement riding around and armored personnel carriers or rescue vehicles that can withstand 50 cal fire. Um, there comes the need, and you know, you look, we've had ours since 78, and we've used it this many times in here. I'm kind of wondering, you know, when we do our capital improvement plan, is there another way to spend that money on something that is going to be proposed in the capital improvement plan? But on the other hand, I know that we've approved a, a brush truck for the fire department, and it's something we don't need in the city limits. We don't have brush. We don't have the need for it. So I understand why we would need it. Fire never let me drive the brush truck, so I don't guess I'll ever get to drive the armored personnel rescue vehicle either, but oh, yeah, I'm kind of will. in a tour mode here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you will. <laughs> you ready to make a motion yet? Does <laughs> it get machine guns on it? <laughs> okay. um, I'm, no, I'm, I'm very pleased with the, the information was received. I was reading through there about what you do have, and I thought... You're going to try and fix that one up there leaking all over the place. It's environmental concerns. We're chasing you all over this town. Because I think leaks is bad as what it says in your report. And I also believe that you would have looked at all kinds of places that some of the best deals are, and this fits the project. It fits what we need here in town. We don't really need it all the time, but we need it when we need it. And if we're going to help Santa Ana, Santa Maria, or somebody else, like with our fire trucks, look, they've been everywhere. We don't use them here, but there is brush inside the city limits of Lompoc, not as much as some people think it is, but uh, your fire, your rig is going to be doing what it should be and help others. So we'll be in contact with other individuals. So the, the idea of looking at finding the best price, finding what's going to fit, what you need, and it's going to help Lompoc. And I'll move that we set the recommendation. Okay. Do you mind if I take the city yeah. manager's re comment first? Man, you know, I, my timing's horrible tonight. <laughs> Chief, uh, were you, uh, if I remember right, were you with uh, L.A. Sheriff's back, or L.A.? L.A. Sheriff, yes. <clears throat> with, uh, was at the time, and I don't know, maybe Captain Mariani remembers as well, there was a, a, a bank heist, basically, in uh, L.A., and there was uh, an absolute war zone that developed uh do you either of you remember yeah, it's a hollywood a hollywood shooting do you and, remember that incident oh absolutely and what's, what's the highest level of cal what what's the highest caliber of weaponry that was used in that you know we revamped event? our whole um method of of arming officers after that and i had an officer who had worked for me who was pensioned off of that and i was explaining earlier at the restaurant he was shot and we couldn't get to him. And what they had to do was they improvised, they put vests on a car and took it in to go rescue him, yeah. among other people. But it changed. We had officers running the gun stores. And after that is when we started seeing police departments using urban rifles. And that's why now it's commonplace to see you know, officers armed with urban rifles for that kind of occurrence. And the world's changed a lot since 1978 and 1979. We used to use those armored vehicles basically to go into rock houses that were fortified. Not so much to rescue folks, but nowadays it's just, it's just a dire need. And that shooting, like I said, changed our primary weapons, the use of urban rifles, and it also brought on the nuance or, or, the, or the trend to use armored vehicles and rescue vehicles. That, that event very basically... Uh... If, if I could characterize it, it, it awoke us from our naivete right. because there, we were absolutely overwhelmed by the bad guys. Absolutely. And, and when you have officers running to, to gun stores to get rifles and to get, right. I mean, it, it just changed a whole lot. Right. So do we have a way to keep those sorts of weapons? Or do you have a checkpoint at the border here in Lompoc that keeps that sort of weaponry out of the city? No. <laughs> I, I got so, you know, I just want to say, you know, it, it's, I'm not buying this or, or asking you to buy it for the 50 caliber. I mean, uh, our ballistic vests, you know, we, we, there's different levels of ballistics vests. And I, I, I got to be honest with you, I wish I had a lower level so that 
it wasn't so uncomfortable, but they don't, they just have, they make this truck, they don't make levels of trucks. So I don't think there's anything lower in cost. This is the lowest cost armored truck we could buy. Thank you. I just want to make the statement, I'm serious about a, a lot of things, but particularly about um, a couple of things as it relates to public safety and that I believe that officer safety, and I think this is an important element of officer safety, and I think, you know, um, it, it's more than just the care for my kids when I talk about officer safety. I mean, um, it's, it's, it's for the colleagues that stand in the gap. And for, uh, as, as to the message it sends, I do believe in its peacekeeping capability because I do believe that a show of strength is sometimes what, what can best keep the peace. And uh, as, as the chief said, you may choose to approve or not approve the purchase, but I would just encourage you, don't let it be over some concern about appearance or a message that we're sending of, because of too much of a show of strength. I make no apologies about send, sending a message to the bad guys that we're serious, and I make no <clears throat> apologies, as I stated before, and as the Chief has stated before, about having the ability in the case and the unfortunate and hopefully unlikely scenario that we're ever faced with what they were faced in San Bernardino, that we're able to uh, respond and protect and take a shooter out. And uh, I just, the, the more I look at what's going on around the country today, the more I see the value of an investment like this. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion. I need a second, then I'll go to Council Member I'll Mosby. second. Okay, motion and second. Council Member Mosby, you had a comment? Well, I was going to second it, but <laughs> cut me out. But I, I, I did want to ask for just a minor amendment to the resolution that it just added the, the, some of the verbiage or the verbiage from the second paragraph on page five of six, where we have the, the statement as made in there that it just says that the the LPD policy will prohibit the use of the vehicle for peaceful protest. The vehicle may be utilized during violent crowd control situations since the vehicle is intended to safely transport and protect emergency police medical personnel during incidents involving potential threats of violence. So yeah, I'd like to see that added into the, the resolution. It doesn't change the character of it, but it, it puts in there to just fortify the statements as made by the manager and the chief as such. So with both your guys' permission. I agree. Uh, Councilman Ve Vega, any more? That's, that's it, man. It's, I'm easy. Okay. okay. I'll second. It's, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Let's vote. That passes 5 0. Madam Clerk, written communication? Nothing. Okay, oral communication. This is your opportunity to speak to us for up to two minutes. Seeing no one rise, we're going to close oral communication, bring it back to the council for council requests, comments, and meeting reports. We'll start with Councilman Vega. Nothing really to report, but this has been a really stressful week. I want you to know that. Yeah. Oh, Councilman Hong I have, I'm sure glad to see the corner of Ocean and H finally uh, shredded. It makes good, and what we were going to talk about tonight, the number of different places that are going to be shredded in the next 60 days. Let's hope it happens, but that was one of the best things I've seen in the last week, is getting that corner clean. Councilman Mosby. I do have two minor council requests. Um, one, one is a request for, as I found out, reading through the study and the answer to my questions about the... Um, what do we call it? The non-rate revenue money for the electric mm -hmm. enterprise. I'd like to have staff do a presentation on that so we can learn some more about that because that was as I was walking around and talking to some people there they were, didn't know it existed. So I'd just like to see some explanation of that, a little uh, presentation on that. And as well as one of my uh, items that I've been looking into. So, I mean, that's, that's the first one, I guess. So I need a second on that one. Or, and a third. I'll second. I'll third. Okay. And that, and then the other one in 
um, my investigations and looking at certain items, we had a resolution 5888 parentheses 14, which was about some of the rate increases that went through. Primarily, this was an LS1 rate, as it was called, which is a street light rate. And I was trying to find out the matching and the mating of the what was presented to staff and the resolution that is finalized. And I'm seeing, um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get to the conclusion how they got. And it seems like there's a little bit of, a few dots are missing. But I would just like us to be able to re revisit that, and if that could come before the council, so we can see with this what what it, basically what happened is was the LED lights that we went through and how the rate went from a certain dollar amount to basically tripling um, through this resolution. And I'm not sure that um, all the methodology was put there so we could have a presentation to connect and fill the gaps between that. Would that tie in with the previous request? Um, there's some tie in, yes. Could we do it all at once? I believe so. I, Mr. Wilkie would be doing the presentation, I'm assuming. Either myself or Melinda, probably, yeah. Okay, so. I'll give him a third. Okay, so you, they're your second and third both agreed to tie it in all together. So. Right, okay. With that, nothing else. I have no reports. Okay, and I have no reports other than um, I did walk in the, um, what was it, the walk Relay for Life. So that was very enjoyable. And that is it. So if there's nothing else, this Lombos City Council meeting is adjourned to a joint meeting of the, with the Human Services Commission at 6.30 p.m. on Tuesday, June 7th, right here at City Hall. Good night and thank you. <laughs>